This is a more than just podcast production. Welcome to Spotcast, Season 4, Episode 34. My name is Tim Mitra. I am in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm joined once again by Jonathan Kuline in Mississauga, Ontario. Greetings and salutations. And we're also joined by Jaime Lopez Jr. in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? All righty. Um, let's dive right in, shall we? Um, yeah, so I've got a link here. We talked last week about Emily Coots. I think this was in, what was this? Oh, it's Out Magazine, which I think I, I found this on um, Facebook because they seem to show me a lot of stuff that, that has to do with... Um, Star Wars and Star Trek and stuff because we we obviously tweet about it a lot. Um, so this is the story that I was, or the point I was telling about last week that uh, Emily Coots was talking about how um, the shooting of the season two finale of uh, Discovery um, after you know after reading the script for that she that's when she decided to come out and I guess we haven't seen the season two final finale yet but uh, it's kind of, guess what spoilers um, yeah talking about how she plays Keela Detmer and and, uh was it helped her come out as uh, as one as as an out person that's all I'm going to say about that and there's a link here in the show notes okay um and just uh, it's funny I was I was editing the um the podcast the other day and one of the things I one of the things I do is I as I go through I, I pick out keywords to basically you know put into the into the the show feed so that you know uh, people can find it on the web and stuff. And so I was typing out John Delancey, who plays Q, and I was thinking to myself, wait a minute, is it John? Is it Delancey? i got to go check the spelling, right? So I went back and checked it, because I personally know, and and Jaime may know of this person, but John Delancey is also the name of, and he's Canadian, is also the name of the head of Apple Evangelism, which, you know, so obviously we run into him a lot. He does, like, the Apple Design Awards. He hosts that that uh, that evening as well. But it's Delancey, John Delancey. The Q is lowercase D E space and then couple, capital Lancey L A N C I E. And John Delancey is all one word. Delancey D E L A N C Y, which is why thanks thanks to an audio format like this, as Hummy would like to say, it can be confusing. Uh, the third uh, thing I've got here is Killing Eve. I found it. It is on. What is now called the CTV Drama Station, like when CTV bought all of the properties, I, I don't know if they bought them or owned them or whatever, but they rebranded them, which just confused the heck out of me because Jonathan and I would know this as the Bravo Channel, mm-hmm. but now apparently it's called CTV Drama Channel 40 on my dial in Toronto. Um, it's on Sunday nights, which is where I thought it was before, and uh, so yeah, I was able to set my PVR to watch the Killing Eve second episode uh, just recently, and um, apparently the 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 trend they call this next day streaming, which is why we can't watch Discovery on Crave on the day it's broadcast on cable. Uh, I think it's probably advertising dollars or whatever, but apparently it's a trend, and there's a link here I've got about. Uh, Chicago One and Saturday Night Live are also um, moving towards next day streaming. So if you're watching, if you want to watch any NBC shows in general, there's a link here I've got for in the show notes about how things are moving from either streaming from Hulu or Peacock the day after they're on cable TV. So there you go. So it's not just Canada, Derry Jonathan. <laughs> you know what? Honestly, if the if the playing field was leveled, that would at least be a start. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just it's kind of like it's not. Yeah, it sucks. There you go. And again, you next have... day, uh, next day isn't the big deal. It's the like three months later. Uh, I, I did get a note from the good folks at Disney Plus this week saying, "Hey, guess what? Disney Plus Canada, you can start watching How I Met Your Father effective this week." I was like, "Hey, I got somewhere you can put that show." Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, it, it's it, it, yeah. Well, we're going to talk about one of the things I, t- I put down here later too, and I'm sure we'll we'll be able to figure out where it's going to go without even being told where it's going to go. But um, that said, I'll hand over to you, Jonathan. You have one thing for the fact check. Yeah, we were talking about uh, some of the characters that we might see in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. We were talking about the Marvels, which is the Captain Marvel two de sort of de facto movie and we're talking about monica rambeau who of course made her debut in wandavision uh she was the 
little girl in Captain Marvel, who is the daughter of uh, of Captain Marvel's best friend. And now she's grown up and she, in one division, she pushes herself through uh, Scarlet Witch's barrier and gain some powers. So we were talking about her and uh, I was trying to fish for her name because at one point in the comic books, the comic books, when I started reading uh, and, and from her in- inception, she was called Captain Marvel too. So she was also Captain Marvel because of the sort of muddled legacy of that name. They decided to change her name to, to photon later on. And then, and then as I did some research, remembered that they, she had changed her name yet again to pulsar. And finally, and not, maybe not finally, but lately as she has been known as spectrum. So she's had a, a bunch of different, uh, different names in the comic books over the years. I would imagine that when she sort of takes on a superhero name in the next little while it'll probably be a spectrum because that's her current iteration but who knows cool all right and then we'll just turn into the headlines here and Jaime, you're up first with the headlines Ooh, spoilers well not spoilers but a treat um, for all of us yeah we got the the teaser trailer for star trek strange new worlds which yeah. uh, seems seems pretty nifty is it just me or does the, do they always sort of have to start off with the, you know, oh, the grizzled gray haired guy with a long beard all by himself on the planet and, you know, forlorn and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then, hey, let's put him in a starship and clean him up and shave him. And didn't they, they, they I mean, they, that's kind of how they started the Picard series. And, and yeah. in fact, didn't, didn't the Discovery start that way with, with um, Burnham and her mother? Um Stepmother, mother, whatever. Her mom, yeah. Walking around on a planet and, you know, looking forlorn and mis- unshaven and, you know, gray-haired. Yeah, I think in this case, it it hits towards something that I think will be the most fascinating part of this show, which is that he knows his fate. The, the you know... I think that's going to be the most interesting part of the show is that is that he's going in, like, he's, he's Christopher Pike... He's, you know, the captain of the Enterprise, but he's seen what he becomes. He knows that he's going to end up as the as the the nonverbal man in the in the in the wheelchair. And I think how he continues to comport himself with that knowledge and not just knowledge like, hey, you know, down the road, this is going to happen to you. But he saw it to know that that's your fate and to still somehow strive for the best in yourself i think is going to be a really really complex underpin to all the stories from strange new worlds and i'm 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 fascinated by that so the idea that he's just sort of like well he's sort of living life and he's sort of you know yeah sort of doing doing what he does because he knows that like and realistically, he knows he's, he's he knows how he's gonna sort of meet his fate. He, he, he could go ride a horse off the edge of a cliff. He's not scared. He knows somebody's gonna catch him. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, huh. So yeah, I mean, I, I find the whole thing a little both interesting and and sort of sad. Although I, I would not want to be wearing a red shirt on that show, knowing that like, you know what's gonna happen to Pike. You know what's gonna happen to Spock. Uh, I guess in theory they could, you know, off number one or something like that or Una, but I, I wouldn't want to be wearing a red shirt on that show because they're going to be looking for victims. They know they can't do it to Pike and Spock. True. Yeah. yeah. Actually. Yeah. Um. Sorry, Army. Go ahead. No, I was thinking similar things of like, you know, when those people kind of just don't care anymore. It's like it makes no difference. Don't shave. Or don't well, shower. I was going to say, yeah, like your life. <laughs> Well, that's going to say that's a, that's a sort of an interesting thing. Like if you like, you know, notwithstanding this isn't really this is made up in fantasy and stuff like that. But if you knew what your future was going to be, then it'd be like kind of Groundhog Day, you know, like you'd be like stepping into traffic and, you know, <laughs> you know, rescuing people, you know, running into burning buildings because, you know, you're not, you know, it's not nothing's going to hurt you until until the day the the warp core blows up or whatever it was that killed them. Right. So. And he saw it, he saw it, for those people who don't know, he saw it on, um, when he, when he touched that Vulcan thing, right? He saw his, yeah, the memory stone things. Yeah. 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 So weird, but that, yeah, it would be a sort of a license to, like I said, step into traffic and stuff, right? Yeah. I don't, red lights don't scare me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's just, um, yeah, it's just kind of weird. It's just, uh, you know, 
we talked about that a little bit, you know, we know that in some of these things, some of these shows just sort of going in, obviously, you know, no one saw Tasha Yar getting snuffed by the, the slime monster in, in like the seventh episode or of uh, TNG. But yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to have a character who so clearly knows their fate. And yet, you know, again, I think what, what I responded to from the, the Anson Mount portrayal of, of Pike was just, he's just this very charismatic, very purposeful, very, um, you know, strong-willed and, and noble person. And I wonder over the course of this series, how that knowledge will affect his decisions and, and everything else. I, I think it's going to be really good. And I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this show. Well, do we really know they're going to carry that thought process through? Like, how how could they not? Like, how how could like? I guess it's one of the defining characteristics of him at this point. Unless they like Vulcan mind wipe him or something, I don't know. Well, I was going to say, did that knowledge affect him when when he in in the shows that we saw him in? Yeah, they 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 touched on it a little bit in Discovery, just like you know the fact that he now has to carry that around with him. That okay, you know that he knows you know that that he knows that cuz he in that episode he still has to sort of overcome the obstacle in the show and he's like yeah i you know, i'm not going to stop being who i am because i know that this is how it's going to play okay, out for me right, i still got to yeah. be me and that again well, it just is one of those things that makes you like the character even more and i hadn't thought about that but yeah you they may they may as a conceit just have you know spock wipe his mind or whatever like of that memory or whatever but, but uh, yeah i don't know i don't know <laughs> put it in the pensive save it for later <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Cool. And and well, so here's the question. Is this the cool trailer we've been waiting for, or is the next one the cool trailer we've been waiting for? That's a good Ooh, question. Next, next so one. We'll, we'll see uh, May 5th, just to put a, a bow on Strange New Worlds. May 5th is when that starts streaming. Um, I, I, I think kind of they missed an opportunity to put it out on May 4th, Jaime, so that they could just like thumb their nose at the oh, Star wow, Wars universe. That would be funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But by the way, season four of, of Spockcast is never going to end. Just want to point that out right now. Oh, yeah. No, we're, we're no sleep till Brooklyn. We're going all night. Okay, I'm mean, sorry. Uh, yeah, no problem at all. We have the uh, another teaser trailer for Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm going to Disney Plus on May 25th. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I am vaguely... Wait, on the 25th? What? <laughs> vaguely familiar with um, some of the things that they show in the trailer, like, uh, like the inquisitors and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I thought that was pretty interesting that maybe we won't spend all our time on Tatooine from what we saw. Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I watched, uh, I, how I saw it actually was on, on Twitter. Um, I caught the entertainment tonight, live reaction video, uh, from the two hosts and a guy, I can't remember. I don't know the guy's name, but he's been on entertainment Canada, Canada forever. And he's apparently he's a star Wars fan. And um, uh, what's her name from the space TV show, but um, magazine show we used to watch. But um, yeah, so he was reacting to it and he's like, who's the big white guy? I don't know in the Kenobi trailer. No, that's that's the great the, the Grand Inquisitor. Oh, that's the Inquisitor dude. OK, all right. Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd seen but I don't know if that comes out of late Clone Wars or Rebels or something, but I've seen that design before. It's Rebels. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah, the okay. main uh, antagonist for the first season of Rebels. Mm, Not to spoil too much, it's it's you know pretty pretty out there. I thought but, it was cool that they had uh, the same actor who played Ben, um, or not Uncle Ben, Uncle Ben, uh, Owen, Uncle Owen, yeah, Uncle Owen, yeah, 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 yeah same yeah. actor from, yep. from the prequels, right? Yep. And I, yeah, I guess presumably his mom too, right? So, yeah, yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting. I mean, it's it's been out there that they were going to have the the inquisitors as part of the series because it's set in that time period where uh, we know from rebels that the inquisitors are basically out there trying to hunt down and kill the last surviving jedi and of okay, course the right. ultimate prize in that uh the two unaccounted for at that point are obi-wan and yoda those are the those are the prizes that everyone wants and, you know, when you hear this sort of narration in this trailer, they're, they're talking about how, you know, the Jedi are compelled to do good. So if you go out there as a, an Inquisitor, you go out there as a, as a Dark Force user and you stir up some trouble and kill a few folk that, that the Jedi themselves can't resist the urge to help. And therefore, they're going to uh, expose themselves. And at that point, you can 
you can stuff them out. So, but, th- so this is sort of following up on Order 66, right? Yeah. So this is basically, this is the, the dark times. This is what happens after the, after the Empire has taken over, after, you know, Palpatine has claimed power, after Vader's ascent, and most of the Jedi at this point. So like the vast, vast majority of the Jedi are gone. They were all killed in, in Order 66, but there are still a few survivors. And... Obi-Wan has put himself in sort of self-declared exile on Tatooine to look over, to watch over Luke and make sure that he's not going to get discovered. Right, right. The Inquisitors thing is interesting, though. And again, I know both of you guys, uh, you know, aren't aren't all the way through Rebels, but it's interesting that they brought those forward. It, it's you know, We talked about how they're, you know, they brought Cad Bane in, in Boba Fett. They're starting to sort of pepper in some of these characters from the cartoons and comic books and things like that. This is, you know, yet another example of the glue that is really forming under these Disney plus series is, is the cartoon series. You know, you really are getting a lot out of watching Clone Wars and Rebels and Bad Batch now they're really becoming quite foundational. It's, it's interesting. Right. Yeah. 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 The Bad Batch was, in, was just in the, in the, in the last series of uh, Clone Wars. I just watched the, they introduced them. In yeah, the that's right. They, episodes, they have their right? debut in the last season. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm, cool. I mean, uh, what's, what, what, what have this struck a chord with you? What was the thing where you were like, Oh yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta be in for this. I think seeing the, the inquisitor, even though I, again, have not seen any content other than probably previews or something apparently for rebels that made that seem interesting along with the what i'm going to assume is a a character that starts sort of on the bad side and maybe goes if not fully good but sort of gray at least um which is always kind of nice especially because presumably obi-wan kenobi is is pretty much you know on the good side so a little bit of balance there a little bit of tension between the characters and it's funny because they only only really hinted with the, the the sound of Darth Vader, but we know that Hayden Christensen is back as Darth Vader, and you don't cast Hayden Christensen unless you're going to do flashback scenes. If you're going to do oh, right. stuff okay. like that, it doesn't yeah. make sense for him to be wearing the mask the whole time. Yeah, with the with the respirator, with the that, respirator, yeah. and yeah. you know. James Earl Jones like voice over the top of that. You, it just doesn't make sense unless you're going to see inside the helmet or get flashback scenes. Like you, you can cast anybody as Darth Vader. It's like, you can cast anybody as Chewbacca as long as you put the you know, tall guy with fur costume on. I yeah, think so it's interesting. Is, is James Earl Jones coming back to do the voice? Or, or... I hadn't, haven't seen that. Now he did actually come back. He did the voice of Darth Vader in rebels. Oh, did he? Um, okay. Spoiler okay. spoilers, but, Vader does does pop up in in Rebels because Rebels is set within a very short time span of the events of Rogue One and A New Hope, so Vader is a player on the stage and he does pop up from time to time. and And James Earl Jones came back and did the voice for the cartoon, which was like mind blowing. How awesome Amazing, that was! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so here, so you know, I was complaining about the the Obi Wan line where he says, "I don't remember, ever remember owning a droid mm. when he meets when he meets R two D two, but Governor, can we talk about Governor Tarkin? Because <laughs> mm. I mean, in Clone Wars, he's like on the side with Obi Wan, and 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 like you know, he's leading the I don't know what, not the Separatists, the other people, right? Um, yeah, no, he's yeah, he's the clone commander, yeah, yeah. So he yeah, so he's the commander, and he's like sort of on their side. So he's he's a bit, bit of a dick then, but oh yeah, but Tarkin's still. on Tarkin's side. Yeah, but but you know, when you get to when you put him into into having watched that and now going back and, and trying to rewatch um, a new hope he is, you know, he's got on Vader's on his leash as it were, I think they say in the, in the movie. Right. And, mm-hmm. and, um, and, you know, he seems to be very disrespectful of um, Darth Vader's belief in the force. Right. Well, Even in fairness, he side. sees how order 66 is so darned effective. Right. Like that's the thing that I think is sort of the missing part from clone wars to, to where we see him later on. Now, admittedly, it's also t- it's 22 years later. It's a, wh- it's a while later, 20, yeah, 20 years yeah. later. But so he's, you know, he's obviously, he's seen that, you know, the emperor manipulated everything, wiped out the Jedi seemingly pretty easily. Right. Like, and then he's seen sort of this, this empire do nothing but grow over the course of his, 
his tenure as as Grand Moff. Right. So right. Yeah. he's got he's got pretty good reason to be like, uh, yeah, you, what you believe in is stupid because look what everybody else died. Like, it's dumb. does he know that Darth Vader is Anakin Skywalker? Yeah, he must. He must because he's right. he's part of the inner circle of of uh, Palpatine, right? He's he's basically the supreme commander of the military force for for Palpatine. Hmm. Okay. Oh, is he okay? Yeah, that's what Grand Moff oh. is. Is basically it's like it's like Grand Admiral of the fleet, more uh, or less. I mean, technically, uh, Thrawn is the Grand Admiral, but he was he is like the four star general. Sure. And and Darth Sidious, Darth Sidious is Emperor Palpatine, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's his. That's his uh, Sith name. His, his Darth Sith Sidious. Name, his name. His secret identity, which which nobody can figure out because he's such a good Darth Vader. Or well, and I, I actually like. I really like that in the last little run of of Clone Wars. I mean, have you watched? I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, n- n- no, I haven't seen um, much. I haven't definitely haven't seen any of the new stuff. But I, I think you're fine. Yeah, I mean, it's not a big spoiler to say that at a, at a certain point, the Jedi actually learn of the existence of somebody called Darth Sidious. But the, what they are not able to do is put two and two together on who that they is. Can't put three and three together, those guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they they struggle a little bit. But again, I think that's the whole point, right? It's the hubris, right? They are so used to having easy answers. They are supposedly have you know sort of become fat and lazy for lack of a better term. Right. And that's why the single operator or the, you know, basically it's start Sidious with some variation of, of, you know, Dooku and, and Maul. And he's able to just ch- chop away at their underpinnings and eventually they, they fall down because they are so supremely confident in who they are and they don't see it coming. And that's what makes yeah. it so like delicious when Sidious wins and becomes emperor. Yeah, well, you know, he can make lightning come out of his fingertips, but um, yeah. the the <laughs> through Mace window, yeah. window. Well, it's odd. It's odd because it's because you know he's the chancellor and he's also running around as as this Darth Sidious character, and you know the the Jedi who are supposed to be so in tune are standing in his office and don't even know that he's like, is he that powerful a uh, uh, Sith Lord that he can mask even when he's walking around with his you know his his, his Clark Kent enter you know identity he as the chancellor like well yoda says that in, in one of the clone wars episodes he says you know that the situation the chaos that has been fomented by the war has really thrown their ability to see clearly to 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 sort of you know uh meditate and see the future and all that stuff has become so cloudy because of so much chaos going on and, and the forces being so divided that they 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 just don't have the same clarity in the force that they did before. Like that's one of the things that's that's why Sidious kind of does what he does is he he starts the war in a way to pick off his enemies and weaken them and then build himself an empire. But he's also doing it because the chaos really messes with the, with the Jedi. Yeah, and so the, I forgot the name of the guy who starts the clo- who orders the clones. Um, oh. Um, was oh. he a pawn of Sidious as well, or yes. Yes, and they do actually. They do address that in a in a Clone Wars episode. They do talk about uh, what happened with him and and all that. I think you must yeah, have watched that I, episode. I, right? I, I, yeah, I went past that one. I'm just that's why I'm drawing a blank on his name. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh God, what's his name? But even but even like Sifo, you know, Sifo DS. Sifo DS. Yeah, yeah. yeah and they do a whole sure, episode they, later in yeah. like uh, season six or beginning of season seven where they basically yeah. explore like who Sifo DS was and, and yeah, they're yeah, trying to get to the root of like. Oh, who was he working for? And that's when they start to put two and two together on that stuff. Still really bad at math. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Like I said, w- well worth watching those last few, particularly the last couple seasons of Clone Wars, but uh, but even into Rebels, like it's really going to become valuable watching as we start getting deeper and deeper into what is clearly Dave Filoni's world. Yeah, we should we should call we could show, should call this show Filoni Cast, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, the guy's doing good stuff. He, he's been doing it for years. He just was doing it in a in a way that people weren't paying enough attention to. And now he's got the big toys and he, you know, people are, are paying more and more attention. All right, what's next, Sammy? In the spirit of everybody's looking at video game properties, turning them into live action stuff, we talked about Halo going to Paramount Plus. Well, apparently 
Amazon is thinking of working with Sony to bring the God of War games in some way, shape, or form to their service as a live action series. Cool. Yeah. I've only yeah. ever played like 10 minutes of God of War back when it first, I think it came out on Mac or Mac no, or something. It was, it, was P, it was on the PS2. Yeah. There, there was a Mac version of, or like oh. there was, there was an Apple, the Apple-ish version, maybe on, maybe on the iPhone when the iPhone first came out to show how wonderful, or iPad to show how wonderfully fast the thing was. Right. Yeah. They're good games. They're fun. They're, you know, they're kind of mash them, you know, get, build up the tree of, of, you know, weaponry and, and do cool stuff. But the stories are pretty good and pretty epic. You know, they're, they, they, it's, uh, it's the Pacific Rim of video games. It's just, it's, it's not yeah, high art, say, but it's how really do you, how fun. Do you, how do you eat popcorn and play on your iPad or your PlayStation at the same time? Yeah. Like yeah. Well, you know, you just, uh, what you do is you puree it and then you drink it while you play. <laughs> I guess. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, honestly, it seems like a in in the world where IP rules, God of War isn't a piece of IP that people know, and theoretically, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Cool. Oh no, not The Walking Dead. Sorry, I had to bring The Walking Dead to the party. So this week we got news: there's going to be a fifth Walking Dead show, fifth, because that's something we needed. Uh, Lauren Cohen and, uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan are going to, uh, star in a, another spinoff from the walking dead. Just so, you know, everybody's like, Oh, walking dead final season, final season. It's, it's, I mean, really, whatever. It's not really the final season if they just sort of keep recycling and recycling and recycling. So yeah. Uh, Isle of the dead is coming. Um, I thought there was already a movie called Isle of the dead. Maybe I'm Yeah. But uh, yeah, they're going to do this spinoff series with the two of them debuting in 2023 on AMC. And uh, so if you are a fan of those two characters, apparently it's not over. There's going to be more. So uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not dying for it, but I would say both of them are very talented actors. I've enjoyed their performances on the shows when I've watched them. Uh, I've met Jeff. He's a good dude. And I think, uh, yeah, I think, you know, if you're going to cherry pick the characters out of there, like I, sorry, I know this is going to might get some hate mail, particularly from our uh, fan, uh, Tammy, but I think Daryl and Carol are wildly overrated. So mm-hmm. I think uh, mm-hmm. th- this has the potential to be good. Well, I mean, the, the in the season, I've just, wa- I'm, I'm tr- trying to get through the final three part, final season, three part trilogy thing. Um they're they're at they're at each other's throats because you know yeah. you know as we've talked about before you know Negan killed Glenn and you know yeah. so so she just has a hate on for him and they they begrudgingly work together at the end of the first part of the season final season trilogy and and at the second first episode of the second section second epic I don't know you know whatever <laughs> in the last episode I watched uh, or second last episode I watched they 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 decide to to continue to hate each other and and they go their separate ways. So it's interesting that they would bring them back. So what is it like going to be like on opposite ends of the Island? And they're going to have like these little clone armies that are, (laughs) and they're going to fight each other or what, you know, they're going to have like, you know, I don't know. Or is it going to be like a sitcom where they, they have, you know, like they have a baby it's the odd together. couple. They're going to do yeah, the odd couple. The odd couple. I was going to say they could do like a laugh track and the whole bit, right? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And we just we established in in Fear of the Walking Dead first season. You know, they 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 say you know at one point one of the characters says, "Well, I've got a boat," and they're like, "Yeah, let's go to the boat." And then they find out the zombies float. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Oops. So yeah. Oops. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, next up. We're getting the return of one of my favorite sort of quietly mm. underrated sort of sci-fi shows, which is Russian Doll on uh, Netflix. So this was a, a really interesting little, you know, Groundhog's Day, but darker kind of story. Natasha Leone, of course, is the star. I really dug the first season. She, I thought she was great. I thought that the way that they dealt with that sort of temporal uh, loop premise was really interesting um funny but also kind of you know um yeah just really kind of astute in the way that they told that story and uh yeah it's coming back for season two uh starting april 20th on netflix so i'm excited for that one i i I looked i'm looking forward to seeing where they take that story cool yeah i I did enjoy that show it's been a while it's been a while since it was on like 
couple of years, maybe. Yeah, it was pre-pandemic. I want to say it was 2019 that that that, that mm-hmm. last one was on. So, right. Okay. It, as I recall, it was not a super long watch. It might be worth a, a little a little refresher, just to yeah. uh, yeah. remind yeah. yourself okay. where everybody yeah. was. But uh, but yeah, I thought it was a really interesting uh, interesting series, and look forward to seeing what else they can do with that that premise. Cool. All right. I mean, apparently DC has decided that it's it's found the winning formula and is taking the penguin role uh from Colin Farrell's role in the Batman movie and turning that into a spin-off series on uh HBO Max. Wait, who's playing the penguin? Colin Farrell. Really? Yeah. yeah. I was going to say wasn't this show called Gotham and wasn't it on a few years ago? Yeah, so <laughs> it is and it isn't. So they're actually taking the character from the new Batman the- theatrical movie and oh, they're the movie. spinning yeah, okay. yeah they're spinning that onto a, an hbo plus so this is more of the synergy that we talked about hbo max is owned by warners warners also owns dc so we talked about how you know we're gonna start to see more of that integration between those platforms we saw them do it last year with suicide squad or the suicide squad came out on uh on in the theaters and was followed up by a peacemaker series on HBO max. Now they're doing the same thing. They're getting a, a jump start. They introduce you to the character in the theatrical movie. And then from there you jump in and you can follow the character onto your HBO max at home. So good idea. I mean, we'll see what it is in execution. I obviously, I don't think any of us have seen the Batman yet, but I, I'll be curious to see what the, uh, whether it's a character that's worth doing more with than they currently are. Uh, that would be my biggest sort of well, did area you watch of any, interest. Any of the Gotham show, the TV show Gotham was on? I watched the first season and a half of that. Mm, yeah. And I think we talked about it years back when we were doing, when we first started this pod, but yeah, I liked the fact that it was just, uh, bat crap crazy like it was just the, the more unhinged the show got the more they just like stopped caring about continuity and logic and common sense and the more they just like let the performers just chew up the scenery and act crazy the more i enjoyed it uh but i also hit a point where it was just like oh that's right none of this matter like it's it's just it's this own little weirdo pocket universe thing that has no bearing on any reality of the Batman that's ever been established anywhere else. And so I just kind of lost the interest in it after a bit of time. I'm told it went on for like five years. I, I, I at some point, maybe I'll sit down and watch the rest, but it just seemed kind of bonkers. Yeah, I, think, I think I made it like three seasons in and, you know, Arkham was involved and, and, yeah. um, but I mean, and but it was very much the Penguin show, like that show. I mean, it was Penguin and the, um, what's Will Smith, Smith's wife's name? Jada oh, Jada Pinkett. Pinkett. Yeah, yeah. Jada she Pinkett was Smith. awful, so bad. But she so was she was in that, in that show so much, like in that show. And but yeah, oh. it was all all Cobblepot was his name, right? Yes, um, yes. Oswald about him, Cobblepot. him sort of being a trying to be a. An underworld kind of guy, right? Yeah, well, yeah. I was supposed to show sort of his his rise parallel to Batman's rise parallel to all sort of all these Catwoman and all the other characters. Again, this is, you know, we talked about it over and over and over again. You know, this is why prequels are so challenging. It's so hard to do a good prequel for longer than, you know, a movie maybe. Because you inevitably start running into these storytelling roadblocks. There's no real stakes because you know everybody lives. There's no real consequence. And you can only go so far because you know what happens to the characters. Like it it really is such a limiting function. The fact that they went five years is interesting, but it's also it's because, yeah, they basically at one point just sort of said, by the way, none of this really has anything to do with Batman continuity. So we could just say and do whatever the heck we want. And they did. But it was just, it was nonsensical. And I and I guess that's my um, hope for this Batman one, is that maybe they can tell a rich contextual story around the character of Penguin, because it's not supposed to be pre-Batman. It's He's supposed to be living in the world that Batman <laughs> exists in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... I don't know. I still think the no brainer of no brainers is to do a, to do the Gotham central series. Gotham central was this brilliant comic book 
from a number of years back where they basically just did a whole series about what it would be like to be a cop in a town with that many crazy people and a vigilante. <laughs> Right, And it was right. so good because it was like, you know, they'd be like, um, yeah, we just showed up to this crime scene. People are literally frozen in blocks of ice and they're dead. Now, what do we do? Like, it's just, you know, what would it be like to try and do, uh, uh, you know, a job like that in a world like report? That? Yeah. 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 Like, you know, oh, we actually caught the Joker. Oh, God, we caught the Joker. Now, what do we do? You know, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's an absolutely, I highly, highly, highly recommend the book. If you, if you're uh, into it, it's, it's straddles the line between a sort of superhero comic and just crime noir. Batman is just sort of in the shadows in the book. Isn't it? But again, the cops are just like, isn't it weird that we like work in a town where this like, guy dresses up like a bat and we have to still try and do our jobs. Crime yelling Martha. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's funny too. Like when you like, I think comic book sort of like stretches the realities. Like you know, when you, when you get like you see um, Magneto after he's been captured and and he's in a completely acrylic jail with mm. you know, acrylic furniture and acrylic forks. You know, like yeah, the acrylic so chessboard. Yeah, yeah. So he can't really, you know, he, his his powers don't work, right? Kind of thing. Like that's yeah. You know, th- like how would they deal with that in real life? You know, sort of thing. And so, but I think, was it you that said last week that, that and I forgot about this, because I remember on the Batman 66 show, it was like this too, that Batman was more of a detective than yeah. a superhero, you know? Yep. Like he was solving crimes, right? Yeah. Fighting that's crimes. my hope for the movie. I mean, we, yeah, we did talk about it a little bit last week. I, my, my favorite part, and I think the, the most neglected part of all the Batman stories throughout films over the last you know, 30 years has been that he's supposed to be the world's greatest detective. I mean, he debuted in a book called detective comics. Yeah. True, he's yeah, supposed yeah. to be not just, you know, punch, punch, punch. He's supposed to be smart and figuring stuff out. You know, he's not just about beating up street thugs. He's about solving crimes and with cool my, tech, with cool tech, with yeah. cool tech. But yeah, but I mean, realistically, he's also, you know, he's just supposed to be an incredible detective and that's my hope. I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward to seeing it for that. I'm I'd like to see a good crime noir Batman story. Cause that's really what has been missing through all of these iterations. It's just that you haven't, nobody's really done a great, well, I shouldn't say that the best version of the Batman is still the Batman animated series. Cause they did so many episodes that they could actually do a proper crime noir, you right, know, right, detective yeah. story. And they did some good ones. But in live action on TV and in, in movies, they've, they've never really nailed it. And and I think that's the part that's missing. Cool. All right. All right. My last bit here, I've got uh, the fact that Warner Brothers, speaking of Warner Brothers and DC, has shuffled the release dates for a bunch of its movies that are coming up. Uh, including Black Adam, The Flash, Aquaman 2, and Shazam 2. So Aquaman of the Lost Kingdom and The Flash are both being pushed from this year to 2023. Uh, According to Variety, it's for COVID-induced production delays with their visual effects being completed. So... Aquaman was supposed to come out in December, December 16th, 2022. It is now being moved to next March. So it's a year away from next week. It's supposed to come out March 17th, 2023. Ezra Miller's Flash movie is was supposed to come out this November. It's been moved all the way till next June. So that's a big kick down the road. Interesting the order of some of these things too. When we'll keep going through this. Uh, Black, does it matter though? Like, well, I, that's the thing. I don't know. I don't know if these were meant to be told as individual stories or if they're still trying to do a connected universe. But so, I mean, this is DC, not not Marvel. Okay, right. It okay. is, but they were they were trying for a while there to do a connected, you know, DCEU with you know all these characters overlapping. I I'm not sure that that's the goal now, given that they kind of lost that battle. But anyway. Uh, so Black Adam, starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson, as was supposed to come out uh, this summer. It's been moved to October 21st this year. And I know Jaime's most anticipated DC movie, the DC League of Super Pets, has been moved uh, to July. So it's coming out July 29th, 2022. And that was initially supposed to come out this spring. It was supposed to come out in May. So an animated movie or like CG? it is an animated movie. Yeah. Okay. And mm-hmm. the last one is that um, Shazam Fury of the Gods. Uh, the sequel to the, to the Shazam movie is moving up. So it was supposed to come out 
next June. It has now flipped and is coming out this December. So a lot of moving around. Cool. All right. And for some reason I saw in this thing. So <laughs> the other two movies that are mentioned in here that are not DC movies is that um, Timothy Chalamet is going to be playing Willy Wonka in a Willy Wonka origin story called Wonka. Because we need that. Is coming out in December of 2023. Uh, yeah. Did, did you guys ever wonder how did Wonka get that factory? How did he trap those Oompa Loompas and make them the slaves in his chocolate lines? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that that was a pressing issue people needed to know. But uh, yeah. And, uh, and the Meg 2, Meg 2, The Trench, starring Jason Statham, is, uh, is coming out it's August 2023. Yes, the, the Megalodon, yes, yeah. Is that what it is, Megalodon? Okay. Yeah, it's supposed to be the yeah, ancient ancestor of the shark. But uh, yeah, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Oh. I haven't seen that one yet. I wrote a whole piece for Cineplex.com about the Meg. <laughs> Never saw the movie. Really? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, cool. All right. So I got a couple of quick ones here before we dive into the main part of the show, but the, uh, beans, which is the movie I talked about last week. Okay. Now this isn't, so, doesn't sound like much, but we're talking about Canada here. Okay. Bean has won a hundred thousand dollar prize for the movie. And Tracy Deer, uh, has, the director has won, has won for Rogers best Canadian film award. I'm not sure what awards those are, but just, you know, good, good on them. I, I think I mentioned last week, it was a really good movie, really well filmed and, and, uh, had a lot of feels for, uh, the, the perspective of, uh, the indigenous peoples that went through that and, you know, the coming of age sort of story of this young girl. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you were around Canada at the time, you know, it was a big deal and a sort of, uh, really interesting, well-told movie. Yep. And uh, the last bit here was, I just read this, and I don't know where, I saw. I think I saw it on the Google News feed or whatever, that from April 1st, Star Trek The Next Generation will be leaving Netflix. I wonder where are they going to put it? Um, meaning that viewers, if you haven't if you haven't seen all seven seasons, Xavier, I'm talking to you. If you haven't seen all seven seasons of um, Next Generation, you need to... Um, Walk over to it. the shelf in my basement, pull the yeah. DVDs out. <laughs> Pop yeah, them in the that's too the much DVD work. That's like getting up and changing channels. You know, <laughs> kids can't do that. I'm um, just saying, nobody has to go uh, long to find long or far, far to find an episode of Star Trek at this house. Sure, that's true. Um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, but if you if you don't know where Jonathan's house is, um, you can, you can <laughs> hit you me up on couple... socials. Just saying. Yeah, I did want to point out today. Today's Mario Day. M Mar M M A R one zero, which spells Mario. Mm -hmm. um, as we record, so uh, yeah, so you've got uh, three weeks basically till uh, they disappear. I my money's going on what Paramount Plus. What do you think, guys? What do you think? It might be Paramount Plus. To be fair, it's it, in Canada. It's irrelevant because uh, all the Star Treks are available on Crave because of the same collaborative crossover. Oh, do you, oh okay, yeah, right. So. Yeah, that's true. I, that's, yep. ooh, I did notice that actually, but yeah, because mm. we have it on both, I and mean, you can watch it on either either of them. It confuses the heck out of my Apple TV. <laughs> yeah. Actually, speaking of speaking of Apple TV and speaking of the Disney Plus app, I, I, so my one complaint about Clone Wars is if if I generally watch, you know, I just, you know, I sit, I, when I'm doing my workouts, whatever, I put, I put on the show and I, and I, and I watch the show while I'm working out. But the, um, because I, you know, like Jaime, he puts Paw Patrol on, I put Clone Wars on. But, um, the, whenever I pause it, like whenever it starts, sometimes it'll play the, I'll watch an episode and I'll, and I'll pause it halfway through and then I'll go away and come back, um, and maybe restart the app or whatever. But on the Apple TV, it, starts the episode from the very beginning sometimes it'll it'll start three episodes ago like previous and even though i've watched three up to this point it'll it just it loses track of where it is this is i mean i know this is a ios you know um persistence issue but my one complaint about it is when i'm watching a show and i want to and i want to hit the back button and go back to the menu and see what the episode is or where it is in the you know, what season what episode I want, it goes back to the main menu like it, I can never get unless I unless I fast forward to the end where you get that little picture of Yoda and it, and you've got the next show starting in twenty seconds and you sort of have to pause you know what I mean like before it jumps to the next episode that's the only time I can ever get back to the menu that lists the episodes knowing yeah um, this is a weird sort of thing but as somebody who uses you know multiple different um, streaming services on uh, 
at least two different devices. Sorry, yes, two, two different devices: the the Roku and the um, Chromecast with Google TV. Um, quite literally, the only service whose channel apps, whatever you want to call them, never ever fails to recognize which episode you're on, what the next one should be, where exactly you are in an episode, um, is Netflix. Like, they're literally the only one whose engineers have figured this out. I've never oh, seen Netflix, Netflix oh, yeah. randomly decide, like, oh, yeah, you, you didn't watch episode two out of, you know, the five episodes that you've watched already. Like, why would you, why would you lose that and then think, oh, I guess this is the next one because this is the next unwatched one. It's like, no, it's not. You, you know that I watched it. Why did you lose yeah, it? Yeah, you're right. Prime did that with me with a, with a couple of shows, too, now that I think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. happened with us when we watched uh, Reacher. Uh, started randomly watching, like, episode three. I was like, what? Did, is this a recap? Did we see this? And went back. I was like, why was there no watching history on here? We're, we're like, supposed to be on episode seven. I don't know. I think I think, I think it may be a glitch in the... in. Well, you're on Google, right? But I was going to say it's probably the iOS 15... OS or something like that has broken the, the ability and they haven't updated or they haven't, nobody's reported it enough to, to mark it as a bug because most of the time on Disney I'm watching like it's it, it's been okay with it's only the Clone Wars for some reason. It doesn't seem to do this on other shows that I watch. Mind you I tend to watch the whole episode then you know as they come out kind of thing on, on Disney Plus but yeah it's just it's it as a user it's so annoying especially as a developer knowing that some doofus forgot to persist it properly right you know when the app backgrounded. But anyway, we get we're getting too technical for for Pete Jonathan, he's falling asleep. All right. <laughs> well, we come to the main part of the show where we talk about things Star Trek, and this time we're talking about again two things Star Trek. So are we're one more episode away from the end of Discovery. Yeah, so this is gonna happen again next week too. Uh we're gonna start off with Discovery and then we'll talk about uh Mr. Picard, Cap Mo Capitan. General Caesar. Picard. General Picard. Was it General Admiral? I got yeah, it was general in this one, yeah. Yes, exactly. the Borg Slayer. General confusion. The Borg Slayer. Yes, exactly. The only good Borg is a dead Borg. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, uh, let's dive in to Star Trek Discovery season four, episode twelve. Uh, I forget what it was called. Species Ten C. Species Ten C. And I'm gonna guess that it's going to be Jonathan doing the recap. Yes, indeed. All disco. All me. Uh, okay, so this is the penultimate episode, so we're really ramping things up, and uh, of course it ramps up with, you know, we're going to need a bigger starship, so they, you know, the first bit is them going, oh, it's big, it's this big, oh my god, it's this big, it's so big. They uh, start talking about, you know, okay, we're, we're, we're looking at this, you know, giant, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, Dyson sphere in the, in space, you know, Oh, how are we going to get in? What do we do? They are trying to figure out how they can basically find the front door to this thing that doesn't seem to have any doors. They <laughs> go down for a little plot exposition. They, they show uh Stamets starts talking about the infinity compounds. Uh, Oh no, wait, they're called the uh, hydrocarbons. <laughs> um, they basically just, they, they showed them all. This one is peace. This one is love. I'm like, oh, okay, power stone, uh, mind stone. Got it, got it, got it. 16 of these things that they're going to use to uh, try and communicate with species 10C. They load up the one uh, hydrocarbon that is supposed to make people feel peaceful to convey that their intention is peace. They load these up into the dots, the little robots, and they launch them through, <laughs> through the roof, which is very funny. And they basically send them over to spray these hydrocarbons all over the side of the, uh, of the, um, the species 10 C's home to sort of try and let them know that they, they come in peace. And it's at this point that uh, Zora for the first time sort of says, you know, I'm not feeling well and I'm, I'm not, I can't put my finger on it, but something's not quite right, which is of course, we know as the omniscient viewer that this has to do with the fact that uh, Tarka snuck into engineering, put a little MacGuffin inside one of the compartments that is supposed to hide the fact that Book's ship is glued to the underbelly of Disco. And then uh, also during that same encounter that Jet Reno was captured by Tarka. And, and we find out later in this episode was stunned. So 
Yeah, we uh, we get the dots. Uh, sorry, yeah. So the Zora says she's feeling off. We cut to Book's ship, and Reno is in uh, her prison. She is, uh, you know, trying to get the, you know, figure out what's going on with these two, what they've got planned. She asks. Uh, she says, "I'm getting low blood sugar. I need some licorice, some black licorice." And so uh, Book obliges, goes over to the replicator, crafts some. Uh, black licorice and, and hands it to her through a little portal in the, in the door. And uh, she takes some of it out and she, she sort of sticks it inside of, a, you know, a pair of pieces of metal. I think we put two and two together. That was probably some sort of communications gadget doodad. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what's going on with that. We go back to the, the dots who were launched. The dots are given the order to start spraying uh, a, peacefulness juice all over the side of this uh ten, ten C's house uh all of a sudden the uh energy spikes start spiking the bridge bridge crew start freaking out oh something's happening something's happening uh the monster from the abyss comes out and wipes out all <laughs> the dots and uh and then before that they can um you know, turn around and warp the heck out of there. The uh, the same self same beastie from the abyss grabs the discovery and and reefs it inside, and and so they are inside species Tensi's home. We go to the opening credits. We come back, and the ship is uh, inside. They have no shields. They have no weapons, and they have no engines. But uh, they are being allowed to continue to breathe and uh, communicate, which is a good start. <laughs> There are three gas giant planets inside, all of them uh, uh, the same, apparently. We get uh, Tarka inside now, is very excited because he's closer to getting the power source that he needs. And so he starts, you know, concocting this plan for targeting the DMA. You know, Book is sort of waving him off saying, no, 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 don't, don't focus on, you know, trying to get to the DMA. We need to figure out how to like, you know, get ourselves free. We need to focus on, you know, bigger parts of this. We don't, don't focus on that. But we already established that Tarka is the capital DT bag and he is just sort of on his own target here. And Reno is really sort of keeping an eye on him. She's trying to look over his shoulder and sort of spy what his calculations are. We know that she's a very, very intelligent person and she's trying to put two and two together on what exactly he's got in mind. Um, and it's at that point that we see her with her, her licorice, her licorice battery pack, trying to figure out how to, uh, sort of use that to, to get her communications device going. Um, we go down to engineering and Stamets and Culber and Zora are there. She does mention, you know, she's feeling off. Culber is like, okay, well, you know, maybe we should, you know, try and figure this out. We can play the same game, the trill game that we played before when you were feeling a little off and we can see if that, you know, helps you to sort of stop thinking about what the problem is and maybe it'll come to you. And, uh, and we get a line here that really <laughs> sticks out like a sore thumb where, you know, uh, Culber and Stamets have a moment where, you know, Culber sort of says, you know, how you doing, Hugh? Are you, are you doing OK? And he was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm still not good. And Stamets says, well, when this is all over, we're going to go on a vacation. You and I, we, we have a much deserved vacation. What could possibly go wrong? We're going to go on vacation when all this is over. I love it when people say that in shows. Mm -hmm. um, so we go now to the. Uh, to the command crew who are talking about how they can uh, work out first contact now that they're inside. How do they do this? They talk about the option of a gift. Could we, could we send them some um, something like, you know, Boronite that would be like a good uh, gesture, you know, Harai sort of talks about, you know, oh, you know, yeah, it's, you never show how these things are going to be perceived, you know, how they're going to be received. Um, so they're having that sort of discussion about, you know, what's the best first move. We go back down to book's ship and, uh, and Reno delivers a, a wonderful Reno line where she sort of says the book, uh, you know, about your friend there, he's a couple cherries short of a Sunday. Uh, yeah. you know, what are you, what are you doing with this guy? And, uh, and, you know, he sort of says, you know, well, you know, I, you know, I need him when you, you need to do this thing. And at this point we get, um, a little bit of background on both these characters, which I thought was interesting. We, we, you know, we think we've spent some time with them. But we get a little bit of background. 
book talks about how he ended up with the name Cleveland Booker. And, you know, we knew from a while back that this wasn't actually his name, but we get that it's essentially the Dread Pirate Roberts from, uh, from Princess Bride that, you know, there's basically the Dread Pirate Roberts goes and, and, you know, relies on the reputation of the Dread Pirate Roberts. And basically when that person has enough money, they retire, pass the title on to the next person and off it goes. And apparently that's what's been happening on the Courier Network. And our book is just the latest in a series of books. The fifth. Yeah, book the fifth. And uh, and we also get a little bit about Reno, where she's talking about uh, how her wife died and how, um, you know, she tells the story of how when the Hiawatha crashed, there was this ensign who was, you know, very badly burned and that she, you know, kept trying to keep that person alive in spite of the fact that they were, you know, pretty much done for and were sort of begging for death at that point. Apparently it takes, uh, take, took them 11 days to die. And she says, it wasn't until that they died that I realized that uh, they had the exact same eye color as my wife, green eyes, and that I, um, I was letting the pain that I was feeling affect my perspective. And then basically flips that over to book saying like, you're just not thinking clearly, this is the pain. You really need to stop and like, look at this rationally right now and realize that Tarka is, is not here for you. Psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so back to the command crew, they're down on the, uh, in the, um, but can we stop there for a sec? Like, yeah. Can we all know that, Tark is a nut bar, like from the get. Like, when did we ever get to the point where? When have we ever really felt sore? Even when he was like being a dick, telling the story about uh, Onos or whatever his name was, Oros. Um, he's always been a scoundrel, like not not a scoundrel, like just just uh, like out for himself, self centered. In fact, he says in the show, in this show, I only ever had two friends. Well, duh. Yeah, I was gonna touch on that line a little later on because he basically says after you know and we'll, we'll circle back to it but after a conflict with book later in the episode he says you know yeah i've only had two friends in my life you were one and it's funny because i just never got that vibe from either one of them i got that they were at at the same cause they both were trying to do the same thing for different reasons and that this was an alliance but i never got a vibe through this whole season that they were genuinely friends i never got that from him and i never got that from book so it was, it was i found that line that line really stuck out for me of like i was honestly expecting him to say i've only ever had one friend in my life and you aren't it like that would be a more true to i right. think who that yeah. character yeah. is yep. you know like thanks for getting me here i'm sorry for for messing you over but really it's all been about my one friend well, it's kind of like like the parallel in real life for me is, you know, as you know, I've done a lot of research on the Apollo missions. And like, for instance, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong were, they were the two guys that went to the moon and landed on the moon first. They, you know, they both walked on the moon. They both had their different, you know, they both had, you know, they, they had a job to do. They had to get to the moon. They had, they each had their roles to play. They played their roles to the T. They did exactly, but you know, by the book, you know. Armstrong did have to take and, and fly the ship by himself kind of th for a second there when they were landing. But, you know, mm -hmm. it took two of them to land the ship. You know, it took two of them to do the walk. It took two of them to take off from the moon and that kind of stuff. And yet, as people, you get the sense that they're very different people in terms of their upbringing and how they lived their lives and how they dealt with the post-moon walk um, life that came to them, right? And, you know, I get this, the impression that they weren't really friends. Like, they were just, they, they had a job to do. They were two co-workers kind of thing, you know? Well, they were military um, men, right? Like, they, they yeah. were used to, it didn't matter who you were standing next to. Well, you just that, knew that's that kinda, person was supposed to do their job. Yeah, and that's kind of how, that's kind of how I sort of, well, all three of them that went to the moon, actually, all three of them had a role, and they all had their defined, you know, their their mandates, right? Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, like, like even though... Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin was called the lunar module pilot. It was actually Armstrong that it was always the the captain of the ship that flew it. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but and he actually you know, held the controls in his hands. I mean, but um, the and that's kind of sort of how I see these two guys. They both they both have in their minds a job to do, right? They're both they both think they're working towards the same end goal. Right. And yet, you know, yeah, they, they're, I would never have thought, like you said, I never would have thought they were friends. Right. Yeah. 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 No, there's definitely parallels. There's definitely parallels. Um, okay. So 
we'll we'll skip back to uh, to the conflict between Book and, and Tarka later on. So we cut back at this point to the uh, shuttle bay, and the Boronite has been delivered as a gesture, as a gift. Uh, and this prompts a response in that we we finally get a look at species 10C, and it's this sort of um, jellyfishish kind of gigantic creature, by all accounts. It sort of looks sort of squidish, jelly jellyfish. Did we actually see it, or was it just sort of in well, the fog? Well, so you, you, you see it in the sort of fog, but then when they uh, there's a display panel next to them, and you can actually see like the scans where you can actually see it, and it looks more okay. like a cephalopod sort of critter uh but giant obviously um so they show up and it starts transmitting the same emotional signals that they were thinking were a great way for them to communicate but then they also are transmitting these light patterns so of course they're trying to figure out okay what does one have to do with the other how do we how do we figure this out and so it, it sort of starts the whole like you know how do we how do we speak the same language uh, we get uh, Ndoye, the 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 rat uh, general from Earth, who is working with Book and Tarka. She uh, agrees to help them uh, with Tarka's plan to break loose of the the uh, abyss type orb that has got it in its, in, got them in, in in its thrall. And so they're going to burn a hole through the through the the orb, and they're going to do that by venting the plasma from one of the nacelles. And then that's going to do that. They're going to use the tractor beam to push off the ship. And then that will get them free of that. At which point it is then Tarka's plan to go after the power source for the DMA, knock out the DMA, save earth theoretically, and get the power he needs to, to do his um, interdimensional transport. So back to the solving of the, the, first contact problem they're trying to figure out you know okay the pattern is repeating itself what does that mean uh you know uh dr harai is there and he's sort of you know a little bit of cervic but he's basically you know he makes the comparison like you know to them we're you know we're clearly not speaking the same language we don't you know we're not we're not as smart as them we're more like a monkey with a rock uh, they call in for some reinforcements they bring down uh, some of the bridge crew and um they sort of brainstorm a little bit and they figure out, well, okay, you know, what does, you know, what does this mean? Um, we do have a quick moment in there where we go down to engineering and Culber and Zora, Zora finally has her moment of, oh yeah, no, I feel better. Oh, you know what it is? Uh, I had this weird moment with uh, uh, Reno and they're like, oh, well, let's just ask Reno. And so that starts the question of, has anybody seen Jet Reno today? Um, yeah, the bridge crew comes down, they start having this little brainstorming session where they start talking about, well, you know, what if the hydrocarbons are more like, more like music where you, you know, obviously you have an emotional feeling, but you also have, you know, math involved. And so they realize that they align the lights with the hydrocarbons. This is starting to get a little complicated, that that is how you speak this basic mathematical language that species 10 C are trying to you know speak to them um we go down to book ship one more time reno's there she says uh to book you know listen you you gotta you gotta stop tarka i i looked over his shoulder i saw his plans and he's planning on pulling the plug on the dma and what's going to happen is that the hyperfield that we're currently in is going to implode and when that power surge goes through the other side it's basically going to turn the alpha quadrant into a toxic waste dump and earth is earth and navarre are going to get cooked eventually anyways so he's not going to solve anything all he's going to do is get hit what he wants out of this we get uh, as a book of course is like oh, that ain't good so uh harai then figures out the pattern back on the on the shuttle bay yes okay so you know we've we're now speaking the same language we've got this bridge language so even though we're not speaking the same language they've sort of lowered themselves they got the same language as, as us um so then we go back to book's ship book confronts tarka says you know hey are you you know were you gonna tell me what's going on here tarka basically says you know yeah like i'm here i admit it this this was always my mission I, you know, I'm going to do this. And he says, but you know, earth is going to get destroyed. He's like, well, not immediately. There'll be like a month. They have, they have time to move first. <laughs> 
which I thought was like one of the most dickish things I've ever heard a villain say was like, Mm -hmm, listen, mm -hmm. Earth's going to die, but not right away. Like (laughs) that's, that's some really good, like villain stuff. Um, Book decides to, you know, take matters into his own hands, goes after Book, uh, goes after Tarka. And uh, of course, we know this, that Tarka is nothing if not well prepared. That's obviously, we talked last week about how he must have somehow got the drop on Jet Reno in spite of the, spite of the fact that she got the drop on him. And yeah, so he's got a shield basically protecting himself, sends Book flying uh, across the, the cabin. Um, we go back to the uh the shuttle bay and they are starting to speak the same language a little mini orb shows up that suddenly manifests doors it's got an atmosphere inside that they can breathe and they're like oh okay well then cool let's 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 hop on board um tarka then uh basically uses his continues to use his shield to beat the living crap out of of book uh at which point he drags him into the same cell that he's got Jarino in and takes away his, you know, ability to take control of the ship and says that same line that we talked about of, you know, well, I've only had two friends in this life and, and you were one of them, which again, still seems really out of place. Uh, back on the... It's kind and, of a, this is why we can't have nice things line too. Right? <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, we go back to the shuttle bay. It's decided that Rillick, Burnham, Saru, and Tarina will go on the uh, mission to go on the mini orb and tr- try and make that one more sort of leap of faith. And uh, we get a weird little aside scene where um, Saru has learned from Tarka how to do primal screaming. And so he's teaches Burnham how to do primal screaming. I thought that scene was really extraneous. Didn't need to be there. Yeah. Why? Like I was going to say, like, again, like they're, they're about to go off and solve this mission. What they do say, hang on a second. We just have to go have a private conversation for a minute. Like, yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm I'm higher on how these last few episodes have gone. I think than you are, Tim, but I found myself at that moment going, Oof, Tim's right. <laughs> so <laughs> the, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was, that was a lot. Um, and, Saru, uh, he has that moment earlier in the episode uh, that I sort of glossed over, but he has a moment where he's trying to figure out, you know, Tarina's be, you know, being a little sort of cold to him. And, you know, Michael sort of says to him, yeah, that's that's what Vulcans do. They kind of show off their aloofness when they're around other people because they don't want to seem like they're weak by showing any kind of favoritism or emotion or anything like that. So Saru goes back and they're all going to hop on this thing together. And Saru says, you know, to Tarina, hey, how you doing? And she says, you know, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, quite uh, unease about doing this. I've never been on this kind of mission with someone for whom I have personal fondness, which is the dirtiest thing that a Vulcan can say to you. I mean, that's just hot. I have personal <laughs> fondness for you. Ugh, that's hot. Uh, they go, they jump into the orb and uh, inside the orb is a replica of the bridge because sets are free. Um, I mean, because it's supposed to make them feel welcome and, and like they're supposed to be there. It reminds uh, me of the episode where, where Kirk gets trapped in a zoo and, and they, they put him on a, on an empty ship. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Coincidentally, we had the sets for this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. We then get a little and bit of in a, LA too. Yeah. yeah. We, we conveniently get a little, uh, a little math problem here where, you know, the, the, sort of math formula comes from them, which is uh, the uh, isolytic weapon plus DMA equals curiosity. Like, why did you send the isolytic weapon against our DMA? We're, we're curious. And so they figure that out and they're like, oh, okay. So now, now we're talking the same, same language. So they sort of piece together that message and then they have to figure out, oh, okay, how are we going to reply? Uh, at that point, we go back to book ship. Tarka uh, is now in charge reno and booker in the 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 um the brig holding pen there the brig yeah i guess it's a brig and he tricks Ndoye by using books communicator to transmit a word message apparently you can text using those things who knew and he basically says you know yep do it okay pull the trigger and Doye does it and uh theoretically things start going sideways back to the small orb they figure out what they need to communicate which is you know dma plus us equals terror they figure out how to express they already know how to express dma they figure out how to express themselves by using 
their uh, their living requirements. And um, and then the, the the message they get back from the species tensi is great sadness. So then we know that they can experience uh, that emotion, and so that really shows them like, okay, so we're we're starting to break down what we need here. Uh, we're over to engineering at that point. They're like, so seriously, no one's seen Reno all day. And they figure out, yes, something has happened here. Oh, okay. It's in, the, in this compartment. They go and they find Tarka's MacGuffin. As soon as they take the MacGuffin out, they realize, oh, wait, there's a ship on our hull. But my, meanwhile, it's too late. What Ndoye had triggered is starting to work. And of course, they it works to, to a T because Tarka, in spite of being uh, a butthead is also a genius and it works and they do exactly what it thought it would do opens up a hole pushes off the ship oh and they're gone and uh at that point the conversation inside the small orb is interrupted and they are all just lickety split sent back to the shuttle bay and uh they are trying to figure out what's going on like why why are we back what happened like we were communicating what happened uh we go back to book and uh reno she's talking about how she did she, why licorice works as a battery uh the glycerides apparently in it uh do that they send a message and the message is coming from uh from reno to the crew to basically say uh we're aboard this thing this is where i am book and i are prisoners tarka's got the ship he's going after the the battery source for the dma it's going to destroy the Alpha Quadrant. It's going to employ the, uh, implode Tensi's uh, bubble. And you need to stop us, whatever it takes. So we end on a nice cliffhanger. We've got a nice setup for a finale. And uh, the stakes are set. We know where all the players are. We have sort of gotten past most of the, the dead space. And now we're ready for what should be, I think, an interesting conclusion. Yep. Sounds good. I, I haven't figured out who the Red Angel is, though, yet. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be honest. I know, and I want. I was thinking about this as I was as I was watching because I was trying to trying to take to heart what you had been saying about the last couple episodes, Tim. And I was thinking about this versus what we've been talking about when we were talking about Hawkeye and when we were talking about Book of Boba Fett. So those series were relatively brief. They were, you know, six episodes, shortish, longer episodes, but shortish series. This is 13 episodes. We complained about how they built up a lot of different stuff, a lot of different character, and then tried to cram too much into the finale of those two series. And how, in spite of the fact that we enjoyed both those series, that they were somewhat unsatisfying in the conclusion because they kind of tried to do too much and then couldn't carry it through. And in this case, it felt like they almost had a little too much time and a little too many episodes. And therefore there was some, some stuff that was just sort of like, you know, come on, stay on target. We're, we're a little too off, off the rails here. But at the same time, I, I found myself watching this particular episode thinking, well, they're doing a really nice job of setting the stage and, and the stakes. I like that. They're not trying to shoot their way through these problems that they're, that they really are trying to science it out, that they're trying to, in this episode, literally math it out. I, I I actually really dug this as a Trek show. I really enjoyed this episode. And as I was reflecting on it, I started thinking about the last few episodes and just the fact that, you know, they had to really go back to the core of Trek to solve this problem. In last episode, they had to go to a planet. They had to, to figure things out. They had to put two and two together and come up with a solution. This episode had to piggyback off what they learned in the last one, but it came back to science and math and exploration and the things that I love about Star Trek. And yeah, this, this episode was probably one of the better ones because, because of that exact fact, like it, like, you know, they're, they're not doing the, oh, it's an alien that has, you know, a nose and eyes, a mouth, two arms and two legs. You know, and oh, and the universal translator is going to magically, you know, translate what they're talking about. I mean, like, they're kind of showing. I mean, in fact, the last episode was called Rosetta, right? Um, for a reason. To, they were talk, they talked about how the Rosetta Stone used three languages to, to communicate between two, uh, two dead languages, right? Uh, or to translate between two dead languages. But the, the, and if we didn't have the Rosetta Stone, we wouldn't have known a lot of ancient history, right? Because mm -hmm. of that, they, they, we were able to decode that. And and 
so this, you know, I was I was waiting for the the typical trope where oh, it's a countdown. It's not a math formula, you know, like you know, it's like get out of here or we're counting to ten, and then you're going to blow you up. But but the fact that they did that, and that is when one of the things that that they would do. I mean, we when we sent uh, Voyager out, you know, mm-hmm. there's a mm-hmm. there's a LP record, and it, it explains on the side of Voyager how to put together the the record player. So that you know the aliens could could play this record. Plus, the messages that they have on there were you know diagrams of of um, what a human being, a, a man and a woman, look like, and you know some math and some you know the golden rectang- rectangle and some pi formulas and you know basic you know geometry. So that that when some alien discovers Voyager, you know, 10,000 years in the future, they'll be able to determine and decipher, one, where we are in the universe. And, 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 and so, you mean, like, what I'm saying is, like, they use symbology to try mm-hmm. and communicate, as you would with someone who doesn't have the same tool set that we have, right? Um, you know, we, we use the alphanumeric, you know, like the Indians came up with the concept of zero and, the you know, uh, the uh, Arabic numbering system and and all that kind of stuff this is how we we all to this day use you know systems that were created you know ten thousand years ago right or thousand or two thousand years ago I guess and um, so it it was interesting from the point of view like you said like it wasn't just a straightforward oh look here, here's some runes and I can decipher them which is what usually you see in in a in a sort of fantasy story right you know mm-hmm. somebody has. The ability to read this mystery, or like even Stargate. Stargate does, you know, the Stargate when the first movie, they had to decipher what the the hieroglyphics were, right? And they always get a hieroglyphics expert, and they can figure it out in like ten minutes, you know, in the movie, right? Yeah. Um, this this was interesting because from that point of view, because it took a minute for them to discover that how these people communicate isn't with words and sounds and and letters. It's with these hydrocarbons, right? Um, and then dis- determining what the hydrocarbons mean, and they decipher. I mean, there's a bit of a conceit there because they did they did quickly figure out what happiness and sadness and you know anger and they had like what think six or eight sixteen different emotions. Sixteen, well, 16 different emotions they determined. Was that Zora that figured that out? Uh, well, they set the dots down, and the dots brought back the, the different things, and each of them had different oh, properties. Dots. But they they oh, okay. yeah again when they're doing the Infinity Stone countdown at the beginning, they list off mm-hmm. some of the things. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So, so that was. You're right. From that point of view, it was good. But then, like, but then they had this goofy scene with with the primal scream, and then, and it's kind of it's kind of interesting the bouncing back and forth between Tarka and Booker. That that's all. That 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 pairing is very Star Trekish too, right? Mm. Um, in that you know, there's this this alien person, and it, we're both aliens actually, and trying to figure stuff out and what's going on and you know so that's good and and a good thing and any any episode would get jet reno and it is is a treasure yeah, right so for sure yeah yeah, yeah no I, I i think this this worked for me on a lot of levels and and it did it did sort of make me happy and it, it felt like a real refute to that criticism of the modern era of trek that we're currently in that i've heard that refrain over and over again from you know other Trek fans who say, I don't like it because it's too dark and it's too violent and it's too cynical. And it, you know, I, that's why I watch the Orville. I I found this was a, was a perfect, you know, uh, counterpoint to that to say, you know, yeah, like the, the solution isn't just punching it. The other thing that I think you nailed Tim is they, in any previous show, they would have immediately gone with, well, you know, because they make a point of saying, well, they're dumbing down their language. So they're they're saying, oh, they're the superior beings. I think the hubris of humanity in past storytelling would have been, well, we're smarter than them. We need to figure out how to talk to these idiots. Here, they're acknowledging, like, we're, we're, we're the, the monkey with the rock. Yeah, we're the monkey yeah. with the rock here. And also, you know, just for storytelling purposes in the past, they would have said, you know, oh, oh, this giant monstrous beast shows up, but it takes a human form so they can understand it better. Or, you know what I mean? Like they would have cheated their way out of it to make it easier for an audience to understand. This requires you to, to buy in and be patient and work your way through it in a sort of more methodical, scientific, mathematical way. I can, I I found that really, really compelling. I mean, how did you take all this in? Yeah, I I think you're, you're, you're quite right in that they, they did, a much better job of trying to balance in what traditional Trek stuff would be and, and 
I had the same idea that that Tim did that the did the Voyager golden record golden disc thing where like okay here's you know a hydrogen atom it's like the most fundamental basic building block of the universe if you can figure out that that's what we're talking about the rest of this stuff is all based on uh, relative sizing and, and other bits based on that fundamental piece including like a a, a map of how to get to earth assuming you know uh, like where all these other big stars or something are and it kind of like the intersection of lines from each of those is kind of equivalent to the uh the cloud of gas where zora figured out oh yeah like you, you take these lights and you rotate it and, oh okay so that's the orientation they're talking about and now from there they can use the that as the base of everything else. so i thought that was all really good um the the problem i continue to see with with disco is that they they still want to throw in the extra amped up emotional pieces mm. and so the the saru and burnham just hulking out it feels weird <laughs> and out of place because yeah you know like in in other shows like star trek the next generation if they'd had an episode exactly like this i can almost guarantee you that they would have had the senior staff working on this problem and then they would have taken a break. It probably is going to be data going off and dealing with Spot and realizing, hmm. So when Spot does this really weird sequence of things, he's telling me that he does not like this food. And that sort of triggers an aha moment for him to say, hey, you know, maybe this is what they're doing. This sequence here is trying to communicate X. And it wouldn't be uh, amped up in terms of the, the emotional drama and, and, you know, quizzical faces or, you know, pointed faces looking at each other. And I think that's the part that they're going to have to balance out for uh, what I assume to be the next season, right? Of like, just just tone it down a little bit. Use the drama when there needs to be drama. Don't have the the heart to heart talks every ten minutes, right? <laughs> of like, okay, we have a limited amount of time. Let's go over here to like Hulk out. It's like, dude, there is no time for that. <laughs> right? Clock is ticking. You don't even have time to use the restroom. Just just pee in your suit if you have to. Right? <laughs> Do you think, Jaime, that, uh, what, did, what did you think of that telegraph scene between Culber and Stamets? Where Culber and Stamets, where he says, you know, oh, I'm, I'm still doing terrible. And he's like, oh, we're going to go on vacation. Do you think that that's foreshadowing? It's so hard to tell because sometimes they want to do the, the we know that you know that we know that you know sort of thing. Where maybe there is like a fake of like, oh, no, he's dead. And it's like, no, it's, it's okay. Actually, they uncovered him. Or, or the, the, the ten C are like so advanced, they're like. Oh, did he die? No problem. We'll bring him back. Right? Like, um, I, I could see them doing that. But you're right. Ordinarily, it is definitely the, ooh, this is not going to end well sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, this could be a total red herring. But to me, when somebody says things like, when this is all over, <laughs> it's like, oh, when are you two yeah, is going to die? It, when is yeah. it ever over? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's it's funny, too. I was thinking about that, that as you were saying that, but, you know, we've had a lot of Culber in this, this season, right? I mean, if you think about it, Wilson Cruz was written out of the show in, like, the first season, right? Um, and and Stamets was a big part of the show, and, and he's only been, like, he's maybe had, like, a couple of lines in each episode for some reason, right? Like, mm, yeah, he's, he's definitely, been, but then he was a real focus of the last season, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I think they're kind of given, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're sharing their shots again. Saru was like a huge core of last season. He's been diminished a little bit this season. I think they're kind of, it's funny because last season definitely had more sort of focus on a couple of different characters. This one felt a little bit more by committee. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're strangely it's more book than anything else, which is kind of strange because I think he's the character we're least attached to. Right. And I was, but the other thing I was really confused about the, like you know, they're they're standing there. The door appears on the size of this of the orb or egg or whatever it was, the the orc mobile. Yeah, and um, and uh, like they're like, I, I'm thinking Burnham's going to go for sure, right? Like that's just you know because she's the center of the show, and of course she's the last person that should go, but that's why she will go. And as they're going through the sort of groups of people, I got really confused about who's going and who's not, who's staying. Like I know that the Earth dude, or Earth lady, decided she wasn't going to go, but. When when she said she wasn't going to go, and then the next person who spoke was was the Vulcan, I thought, did she say she's not going or she is going? And then you know, and then the president, of course, says I'm going to go. And then, but it's kind of like I thought, okay, it was just going to be her. And then, but it can't just be her because you know this this is this, the the Michael Burnham show, right? Um, 
Yeah, it was just odd the way they sort of selected who was going to go and who was going to stay, and you know, because it looked like the 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 doctor guy, um, he looked like he was disappointed having to have to stay, right, stay behind. Yeah, well, you know, it's hard to get a read on that guy. He's he's playing it a little close to the vest. Yeah, I yeah. felt like it was a weird political thing that that the president just messed up the thing because I think you probably should send uh, Doctor Harai because he's talented at that. Yeah, they also talk about the talents for Saru and they talk about the talents for Captain Burnham. So those all make sense. It's the president of like, okay, other than being like the leader of our people, we can't even say that you are the leader of our people because they may not have a leader concept and we may not know how to decipher right, how to right. communicate that. So like you right. bring no value here. And I think she's sort of like... Well, exactly. And they may just offer her as soon as she arrives in their, their door or whatever. Yeah, right? she, she, she just jumped in the car and said shotgun and everybody's like, oh, okay. Um... <laughs> All right, what are we, we going to do here? Who else gets to go in this car, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Weird. Well, I still feel like this was a good setup. I mean, you know, I think I'm I'm actually, I sat down today and I was like, ooh, what do I watch first? And I was like, oh, I'm going to watch Discovery first because I really want to see what happens with this sort of story that they've built up. As much as I love Picard, I, I kind of wanted the, the, the Picard to be my dessert. And um yeah, I mean, I, I thought both episodes were good, and we'll talk about Picard in just a couple minutes, but I really thought that uh, as far as a penultimate episode, as far as setting the stakes, as far, you know, again, we always talk about can they deliver, can they can they, they give us a satisfying ending? I, I guess that remains to be seen, but... Uh, well, they also have to give us the incentive to want to see the ending, right? And I think they did that pretty well this time. Yep. Yeah. Although I don't know where Booker and, and Tarka have gone, though. Well, theoretically, they're going to go blow up the DMA. Oh, or they're leaving to do. Oh, that's where they went. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. I thought they were. I thought they were inside, and they were going to blow it up from inside. Anyway, okay, never mind. Well, All they're right. inside. They're inside the hyperfield, but they're not inside that Abyssian orb. Right. Gotcha. All right. Should we move on to Picard? Definitely, <laughs> Mister Jaime. Yeah. Season two, episode two, entitled "Penance." So this this episode sort of splits into like three different pieces. The the first piece is the "Where is everyone?" after we were left with, you know, Picard and Q and, and, you know, everything has changed. So let's start off with, uh, with Picard. So he is with Q. We get a little bit of that recap again of Q telling him that like Picard is himself, the, the board on which the game had played. Uh, apparently in this reality, he was, a uh, uh, he being Picard was a high ranking general in the very human centric confederation. They conquered a bunch of alien races and kept their skulls as trophies. They just threw so many, uh, uh, lower decks esque uh, goodies here of like this one is D- Gold Dukat and this one is Martok and this one is Sarek and oh his son was there at his execution I'm like which son are you talking about and we don't talk about Cybok right <laughs> <laughs> was his daughter there too yeah they 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 they, they, they teased a the lot Earth of child the Earth child there yeah. um uh, there was a Ferengi as well i don't know if it was a specific one we know i didn't catch if it was like it a had big ears maybe grand negus well it, yeah, had, it, had, it had ear bones which i thought was odd right yeah considering ear we don't bones. have ear bones yeah exactly mm-hmm. uh you've got uh seven who who wakes up all confused uh she doesn't have any of her borg implants she's apparently madam president of the confederation uh married to the magistrate and is apparently you know, her big thing on her agenda today is to give a big speech on Extermination Day, which seems like the the equivalent of, what is it, First Contact Day? Is that what they call it for the, the big celebration day in the Federation? Captain Picard Day? <laughs> there is that as a more minor uh, holiday, but like this, you know, this is the, the, the big one. Um, you know, Rios awakens as well in, in the new timeline. He's he's a colonel on, uh, on La Serena. He's apparently involved in some sort of anti-Vulcan raid. Again, you know, going into the uh, Confederation is, is very human-centric. They, they keep saying, um, what is it? A, a, a happy future is a human future or something like that, or good future yeah, is a yeah, yeah. human yeah. future. Yeah. Um, you've got Elnor, who's thrown right into the middle of some sort of uh, Romulan resistance cell with his uh, his girlfriend who, who gets pew-pew-pewed out of the out of the scene and and thankfully for him rafi is part of the enforcers that are fighting the resistance so she you know takes him prisoners as oh i want this one alive for questioning and you know that sort of thing and rounding things out is dr gerardi who's still a scientist 
in the Daystrom Institute in Okinawa, or presumed Daystrom Institute. I didn't see if they had the sign there. Uh, she apparently likes cats and Pat Oswald in this timeline because you got the weird, <laughs> the weird two D animated cat uh, uh, AI character talking to her. Yeah, so it's uh, that's sort of like the first third, right? Of like, where the heck is everyone setting or the pieces and then moving the pieces in motion is bringing everybody back together slowly, right? Man, the autocomplete is terrible here. I, I kept fighting <laughs> autocomplete as Eleanor and apparently turned Ra- Rafi and Elmo? Eleanor into Rafi and Elmo, which is a very different show. <laughs> so Rafi and Eleanor come together, as I mentioned, uh, you know, as, as the uh, the captor and, and Cap T7 and Dr. Trotty come together because uh, as part of this extermination day, there's like this big, cool thing. And she needs to go to the lab and, and, and see what's up. Uh, thankfully, Seven has the 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 wherewithal to contact Captain Rios, uh, Colonel Rios, and say, "Oh, I, I need uh, I need some some insight from you know from the field, right?" And her her husband Magistrate is like, do, "Do you want General Cisco?" Which is another nice little Easter egg for fans. And she's like, "No, no, no, nobody so high ranking. I want you know, somebody kind of it, it boots on the ground, right? I don't want I don't want to." smoke just happens that rios's name appears on the screen on her on her desk yeah exactly as she's trying to figure out what's going on really yeah and she's she's smart right she's able to like give him clues of if i say these things will you figure out that uh i'm not who i'm supposed to be the way they did that throughout the whole episode was really funny and clever yeah she said federation at first he said federation and she said i'm confederation yeah exactly well, and it's funny that how he kind of he kind of controls her, like he's the man of the house, sort of thing. You know, like there's that very strong vibe, even though yeah. she's Madam President, he still has seems to have an upper hand over her. Yeah, yeah like the chief a little of staff. weirdly misogynistic. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, short, of course, that makes a lot of sense, right? <laughs> uh, Doctor Girardi is the one who has the most difficult time catching on with the the scheme. It's, it was kind of fun with. Um, the whole, you know, gazing at stars thing that Seven is yes, trying to tell Yes, gazing her. at stars, stargazing. Seven, like, what, what, who's that? Oh, yeah, that's your drinking name. It's Seven Shot Hanson. Or <laughs> seven, seven Shot Hanson. Yeah. Seven, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, and, and lo and behold, here in the lab, in a little cubby, is uh, the, the Borg Queen, all confused about what the heck is going on. A uh, little note here about imagine being able to hear different timeline versions of yourself and realize how wrong things are. That must be very disconcerting. You know, as part of this yeah, day... Poor Borg, eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as part of this day, uh, General Picard is getting escorted to go see President Hansen. Um, and he, you know, happens to notice Rafi and Eleanor. He swaggers in, takes control of the situation. Because Rafi's getting a little bit of gruff from one of the... Uh, like lieutenants or something he's he's just like oh who who authorized that you take this prisoner he's like i did and he just kind of big dogs her, which was kind of a nice thing to see yeah and it's something you've never seen from him before which is really kind of it's it's funny to watch him usually he's such the amiable character and now he's just like i'm in charge here yeah (laughs) yeah um so we do learn here that you know this is not a like you know mirror universe type situation but that the premise is that this is the same reality that they know and love, except Q has changed that reality by changing time, but going back and doing something to to mess up how things turned out to be. So we, you know, we've got everyone pretty much back together, except for Rios, who's like trying to find a parking spot um, outside of Earth. They determined that a, a I wrote this down temporal rescission occurred in 2024 in LA. They they get this notion from the Borg Queen's ability to sense what's going on from different versions of herself, presumably. So they kind of decide, like, all right, uh, how are we going to go back in time? We don't necessarily have access to that tech. But it's like, well, we could name drop Spock here on the crude slingshot maneuver. We could try that. And, yeah. Well, yeah. It's really tough, but we don't have a Spock either. Like, we do have the queen here who could do that sort of processing. So their, their, their mad idea is let's take the queen with us and use her to... Um, we'll plug her into the engine and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Under the premise of like, hey, do you like having all your Borgs, you know, friendly drones disconnected from you dead? You don't? Great. So then our interests are aligned, right? You want to go back to 
the Delta Quadrants in the reality timeline that we happen to know and love. Um, and hey, uh, side note here, when they try to beam out and everything, um, the Confederation has sensible anti-transporter protocols, which we never see anywhere else in the Federation. It just leaves all their, their butt hanging out. Um, <laughs> and they also have sensible anti-Borg <laughs> escape protocols because they, you know, the automated uh, security system just shoves her back of the cubby hole, uh, apparently as part of a Q yeah. for... Uh, not a QQ, but a QQ. Um, parse that one out. Um, in order <laughs> for her to be executed by General Picard uh, on stage. Right. So that- it reminded me of a big tape system I used to have where I had like, it was this robotic um, arm thing. And it's sort of, it's kind of like the. Sometimes you see in movies where they, in the future movies, where they put people in cells and they freeze them and they, they have like a big like parking lot of them and. They have this loader thing. That's the kind of impression I got from that was that there's a whole vault full of of these treasures, and you know, Gerardi had to go and get N ninety one or whatever, and it brought it up to the into loaded it into the thing and brought it forward. That's where the Borg Queen was, and it obviously put put her back in when when the protocols kicked back in. Right? But it yeah. wasn't like wasn't like she was just behind the the door. She was like in this big sort of storage system. Yeah, with with some. They- Either the computer voice or a screen or something mentioned some sort of anti-Borg protocols that, like, yeah, he's either like feeding her drugs or uh, otherwise affecting her her assimilation kind of uh, knowledge. So they they've got oh, that they've was got all in her, that was all in her legs apparently. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, um, those. Uh, so Gerardi, despite me saying that she was bad at catching on, you know, what to do with the, uh, you know. Or, can you can you pretend to be who you're supposed to be and while well, letting me know that you're actually who you are? Uh, she's surprisingly good at rambling a good cover story, or at least a reasonable cover story for why the heck this motley crew is together down here in the lab in front of um, in front of the magistrate. And so they like head off to this you know supposed public execution celebration of uh, uh, extermination day. Uh, the red and black I thought was a bit on the nose as a color scheme, uh, but it but it does look good. I mean. You know, he separated out yeah, from bad that. historical things. It, it, it's got to look. Did you guys catch before they as they as they zoomed in on on San Francisco the um, Brent Spiner voiceover? Is that who's that voice when they're like? Yeah, I back up and listened to it several times. Yeah, it's it's like there's I a thought little for a statue. second it was Patrick Stewart, but it didn't sound right. No, no, it's it's it, the little statue is Brent Spiner, and and around the ring it's spelled out Adam Soon and Jason Soon or something like that. So, like, it's obviously the, the legacy of the soon people, and, and he says, yeah, the only human is, a, or the only good human is a dead human. I don't know what he says, but, like, something like that. But the line. Right, yeah, the good the, alien yeah. is a dead alien, yeah. Yeah, no, the, it's something about good human or whatever. Like, I'm, it's, the, it's I'm, the line I'm messing up here is the line from Planet of the Apes, the only good ape is a dead ape. But yeah, yeah. the, the um, uh, what's the line that he, that, that Picard says about in, in his voiceover speech about, you know, like, you know, the best society is a human society or something like that or whatever. Yeah. 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 That's what, that's the line that the Brent Spiner character says as they're flying into, into San Francisco. Hmm. Cause obviously the Academy has gone too. I don't know if that's another thing to point out. <laughs> like, I guess they don't need an Academy if they're just, you know, creating lunatic, lunatics and murderers. I don't know. They're having you on the red and white. Red and black. Well, the, the reason this has to to kind of continue forward is to buy some time because, you know, the, the sensible security protocols mean that our, our crew here has to figure out how do they, you know, punch a hole so that the transporters can be used. Because Rios can still use the transporters. He just isn't you know, for locking onto them, but he can't actually initiate a transport. Uh, and even worse, they can't communicate with them. So Gerardi's spending time trying to cobble together some sort of way to talk to Rios. Uh, in the meantime, she takes apart her communicator badge. Yeah, she's trying to MacGyver it with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, which which is kind of like you know, like how do you take apart an iPhone kind of deal, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't have the right pentalobe screwdriver, you're screwed, right? Yeah, uh, you know. Meanwhile, uh, you know, Rafi is bringing Elnor along as bait to distract some of the security folks when she goes into the the palace computer. Uh, computer bays and like oh like here you go i brought this guy as a treat for you to beat up and they they definitely do make him take some punches uh but once that transporter window is open man do we discover that he is not locked in there with them they're locked in there with him because he just like destroys them even though his hands are are, uh, are cuffed right speaking speaking of the gory era of track he 
it kind of goes medieval on them a little there. <laughs> yeah, it dodges a, like a throwing dagger and then pulls it out and slashes another guy in the throat with it and stuff. It's just like, wow. Yeah, he kills two of them by like slashing their throats. It's just pretty, pretty gory. Yeah. Um, th- this is the point at which, you know, Picard has been kind of hanging onto the gun a little too long on the on the board queen and people are jeering. You're like, what's, what's, what's going on? Kill her already. And uh, he decides to pew, pew, pew the other the other guards around and uh, thankfully get Just the a bit of advice. If you go to an event and they start chanting blood, 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 maybe go, maybe leave, maybe, maybe leave, maybe leave the event. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Um, but Rios is a little unhappy at the idea of putting this very dangerous person right next to the engine and hooking it up. <laughs> well, the last time they plugged the, plugged the board queen into their console didn't turn out so well, right? Yeah. Yeah. This guy's got memories of that sort of thing. You know, uh, Bad stuff happens. Deflector shields are disabled. Bad guys beam on board. Elnor takes a takes a shot, and uh, the magistrate is uh, making quite the point at gunpoint with Picard of like, oh, what will what will they say? They have your your head on on a pike, so to speak. You know, Picard the traitor. And there you go. Yeah, That's the end of the, the episode. Yeah, interesting episode. I was, it's funny, like when they when they first managed to beam out of the area where they all got together, and then you know I'm thinking, oh, they're going to go off and you know do the timey wimey thing, and then next thing you know, the, they they resolve back at where they started because of the anti anti transporter thing, right? Because you, you do see them appear for a second behind uh, Rios in the ship, right? But that was that was a good little twist. I don't think I don't think Star Trek fans are expecting that one, right? Yeah, it was funny to sort of the, uh, subvert those expectations, just sort of, oh, wait, wait a minute, that always works. Why didn't that work? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, then, and then, you know, immediately the, the, the protocols are still kicking in because they start shutting down comms and they start shutting down, you know, they put the board back in her vault and all that kind of stuff, yeah. Cool. And that, that, that you know, I, I knew, like, like that, that uh, magistrate dude, when he walks in, you know, when Borg is, or when, um, sorry, when Seven is getting, or Annika, what are we calling her, um, Madam President, when she's, you know, getting ready in the morning and he walks in sort of very authoritarian, um, he, I think he does say deer or something like that. But, yeah, he calls her he, deer, yeah. But he does have that sort of very, like, you know, I'm in charge here kind of thing, where I'm I'm like your, your personal assistant and I don't suffer fools and that kind of attitude. And, um, and interesting how she sort of plays, play, like, you know, puts on airs and and you know is able to fool him long enough and he keeps talking about you know i'm gonna have to have you scanned or you know because you don't seem to be behaving yourself properly you historical hysterical woman person you know which which is one of those great lines because you're like "Ooh, what would happen to me if i said that to my partner (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah man yeah it's arguably you know the only mistake he makes because everything else was like he was so close to sensible protocol right it's like you're acting so weird we got to get you go scanned if like you know alien brain juice is taking over you or something yeah well and and admittedly picard did stand there for a long long time you know while the, the crowd is chanting to the point where the crowd stops and looks at him and going like come on already you know like it should be there over should be by board now. blood everywhere by now yeah exactly yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's, inter- it's interesting. I was wondering because they were supposed to have supposed to supposed to supposed to give a speech, and she never says to him, "Can I see the speech I'm supposed to do?" <laughs> like, yeah. or the, and, but ob- I guess there must have been a teleprompter or something. Mm-hmm. But because there was nothing to sort of indicate how would she know how would she know what to say to this crowd who would expect her to be the president who spoke to them like a couple of days ago, kind of thing. You know, it was an interesting episode. Like, sort of, uh, you know, I like it, it flashes back to the. Um, you know the scene where um, the Kirk and Spock beam down to the planet, and and you know it's they're trying to find the old uh, the captain that had been left abandoned on this. He went to settle some or do some first contact stuff, and he ends up being the leader of the. And it's sort of like the the uh, fascist. It turns into a fascist thing, and they've got the whole Nazi regalia and stuff. And you know Kirk wearing the the captain's uniform, and Spock with the the Russian helmet with you know, hiding his ears and that kind of thing that episode or the episode where they beam down and the, and it's like a Chicago gangster thing. And they, they just start like putting on the, the care acting like a gangster kind of thing to get themselves through the situation. So it's very similar to that. It flashes back to that kind of, you know, um, Star Trek people on, on away missions, you know, putting like pretending to fit in kind of thing. Right. 
you know, they never did that in the next generation. Next generation, they almost came. Well, they very rarely did, but they would they would either disguise themselves as as the natives to try and hide themselves, like they would put on a Bajoran Bajoran nose or whatever, or they would just beam down and say, "Yeah, I'm. You know, we're here to make first contact." And they never really sort of did this. They had fun with the characters, or fun with the. And of course, you know, in Star Trek sixty six version or the original series, it was always the back lot at in at the studio like oh look we've got a you know a, a town setting here let's use that as an episode right kind of thing you know we've got horses how can we fit horses into this episode yeah or the okay corral one they did once and yeah exactly yeah, yeah. or even kirk with the what was the one where he had to fight the dude and the the lizard guy yeah oh the gorn yeah gorn yeah and and they just sort of went to like you know a sort of stony outcrop outcrop near hollywood and filmed that part right so yeah i will say the only part that kind of took me out of this episode was the was the crowd stuff and yeah. i think it, it was just you know you realize oh yeah this was filmed during covid oh yeah there's no way they could do a proper sized crowd but you know it's supposed to be like this is the momentous day for the confederation so we've got eight guys here and they are psyched like <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, but they but they did that thing like yeah, i remember you were telling me when you when you first studied um journalism that that you always frame the shot so it looks like there's a big crowd when it's oh, just yeah. like four guys right yeah yeah but but the because I did, I did go back on that scene because I, because I, because I ended up watching that scene twice because of the, because of the fact that I watched it on Crave and then when I was waiting for Discovery to start on cable, you know they had the Picard show just before that, so around nine o'clock our time was when that was playing because you know God forbid they should have like uh, regular hour long episodes anymore, like the Picard one was an hour and ten minutes and and then the um, I think the Discovery one was as well. With I guess they had to shove the commercials in. Right? At one point, at one point, I was flashing through the commercial. They must have counted ten commercials in a break. Mm. But uh, yeah, so um, the I, so I stopped and I went back because I went. I wanted to say, oh, well, I real I recognized that when I watched it the second time that 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 took place in a, like a place like you know, Massey Hall or or Roy Thompson Hall. And I thought, oh, let me go back and see where that was. And then I remembered it was in L.A. and I wouldn't obviously wouldn't recognize the place, but. That scene where you know Seven is doing her speech and Picard is you know supposed to kill the um, the Borg Queen was was in a theater like like a Massey Hall kind of place right I'm sure if you live in L A you probably recognize what it was and they had they had sort of CGI'd people into the side to make it look like it was full of people John you know? yeah but it was I don't know it it, it it didn't convey I think what they were going for the other thing that I thought was really interesting is. So, you know, humanity at this point is supposed to be sort of, you know, embraced a humanity overall kind of thing. And they've got this building and it's filled and we're celebrating Confederation Day. Wouldn't it have been filled with like dignitaries and yeah. like, yeah. like uh, a military or, or something, not just like rabble what looked yeah. to be the rabble of Los Angeles. Like it did, it, it just, to me, it felt a little out of place. Yeah, that's true, and and yeah, because I mean that kind of, it was kind of like gladiatorial, like the sort of they were trying to do the the Colosseum kind of scene where you know the the crowd does the thumbs up thumbs down thing with the with the emperor kind of thing, right? At the end mm-hmm. of the battle was that sort of that sort of vibe they were going for. Well, you're right. Where it would have, there would have been you know there would have been the cheap seats and the the people up in the you know sitting near the emperor would have been you know all the people with the fancy clothes and gold and incense and myrrh and all that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But to me, it just seemed a little bit um, uh, off that, you know, like who let these people in here when with the, you know, her royal highness and the, you know, the general and everybody. You know, I don't know. Just to, to me, it sort of seemed a little incongruous, but what are you going to do? Yeah. And Patrick Stewart, I, again, he does look like really old. <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, he, he is. He is looking older for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And but I mean, like, you know, like, like, how could he be? At his age, how would he be the 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 penultimate, you know, army like you know leader of the army kind of thing? You would think it would probably be somebody in the late forties, early fifties kind of thing, you know, not in their eighties, right? Yeah, that's the thing. Like I could see him being like venerated as like the hero who did these things, but not like the active one who's like yeah, still yeah. doing these things. That seemed again a little a little unlikely you kind of have to sort of suspend your disbelief and be like well sure you could be 96 and do that why not i could see like a jonathan frakes playing that role like like that would be more, like from a from a how old the actual actor is and you know, mm. 
He would he would be like they would be better if they had like a Riker dude, you know, doing this kind of thing, and Admiral mm. Riker or whatever, or Worf, you know, like the guy the guy who played Worf, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, but yeah, it was uh, it was, it was a good, good show. You know, I, like, I liked I liked the whole the whole waking up and and the timey wimey and where are we and and trying and them all trying to you know be smart enough to figure out where they were really quickly, right? Yeah, yeah. Although, so two things that stood out to me this this episode, one. There's a moment of recognition where Picard's like, oh, of course, 2024, that makes perfect. Los Angeles, yes, that makes perfect sense. That makes and no sense. <laughs> maybe it will come back around, but I don't know about you two, but I was like, sorry, what? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. The other part that I thought was kind of strange, and again, just disappointing, we talked about it last week, it seems like they've written Soji out? Issa Briones Yeah, is where was she? She had gone? no role in this one. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm just disappointed because I really did. I thought she was quite captivating last last year and the, on the first season. And I I was looking forward to like, well, where do they go with her? And you know, and just to have her like have a little cameo in the first episode, and then she's just sort of gone. I I just found that really disappointing. The and other it, conceit, the other conceit is that that um, um, Doctor Gerardi can just pick up the instruments and start using them like as if she's used them her whole life. Well, these are all new things. Like, you know, mm. she's, how could she, how could technology have evol- evolved in 200 years and still be the kind of tool that she would recognize how to use. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like how do we know that batteries would have evolved to the way they had and micro circuits and stuff like that. Right. Like things just, you know, flying cars would have been different, you know, like, I mean, like you can't just, say that you know we go back and change one thing in in time you know the whole butterfly effect you change one thing in time and like a timeline changes you know like mm. you know I, I think it's interesting that that i mean my i will give them on that same same point i'll give them i'll grant them that you know that monica is the president you know kind of thing right yeah uh you know that you know that that's kind of awfully off, awfully conven- convenient right so well, it certainly does move the plot faster. You know, we talked about how they like figure it out really fast. I'm like, it does help if one of them is the most famous war hero slash criminal in history. And the other one is uh, the president. You can move things along pretty fast if you've got that kind of gravitas. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it gives you gives you a place to stand from. Right. Whereas like, you know, again, like Paca- like um, Kirk in that in the, the one with the. The Nazi Germany kind of thing. He puts on the captain's uniform and then acts like a captain. And and because he's wearing the, the insignia, they treat him with respect, right? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. You know. And there's one where there's another one where I think it was I don't know if it's the same one where he's he puts on like a captain's uniform and then Spock is his prisoner kind of deal, right? Like similar like what it did with Elnor here, right? Yeah. yeah. Put the Wookiee in the handcuffs. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> I think the year thing, I, I don't know if it's supposed to call back to something like the bell riots or, or other things um, that we've seen in Trek before, or if it's meant to be kind of a, even if the audience doesn't know a, a person in that universe would know, like, you know, if some timey wimey stuff was happening and then somebody says, you know, at least an American, Oh yeah. December, 1941. And play. Oh yeah, that totally makes sense. That's why there's no uh, USA, you know, because we we never, you know, we never had the attack on Pearl Harbor that got us into the war. We never became a superpower. Was that the year that that Japan attacked forty one? Yeah, 41, December yeah. forty one. So it, it would be something to be super meaningful to an American, but not necessarily, you know, like Canadians, right? Well, because I mean, like in nineteen forty, well, thirty nine forty is when the world went to war, right? And the Americans weren't involved at first, right, until Japan attacked. Yes, they were trying to be neutral. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's kind of sort of like how it is today with with the, the stuff happening in in Ukraine. You know, right now everybody's kind of like deciding where they want where they want to be involved, right? Sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I don't know. I, I'm curious to see how this continues to play out. Time timey wimey is is good, and it's a good element of track, and it's it's something they go back to. There's a part of me that's just sort of nagging in the back of my mind, being like, "Ooh, I hope this isn't too far fetched." You know, like they've got the Borg, they've got Q, like maybe, maybe save one of those for season three. Just, I don't know. It's, it seems like a lot. It seems like a well, lot. There might not be a season three, right? That's the there is a we... season three. Actually, I was going to tell you guys. So there's, there's two things that I, I gathered, one of which I've got the stuck in the show notes here. And the other one I'll mention now, uh, 
Yesterday was the day they wrapped season three. The series has been filmed, it is done. Oh, okay, filmed. They are okay. now going to go into post production. So the okay. principal photography is finished on um, Picard season three. It is only three seasons and then they're done. So that's that, that is in the bag. It is happening. Uh, irrespective of what happens to Patrick Stewart from here on out. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. That's where I'm going with that, right? So yeah, can come yeah. back as a CGI or something in the future. We have the same thing, the technology to put him into a, you know, a robotic body, right? Yeah, we, we can put him. If into we can spare like, that on uh, one person, can we spare for Sir Patrick Stewart, please? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you mean in real life? In real life, life. yeah. 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 Uh, the other thing that I, I had added in here that uh, Jaime referenced earlier, so there's a story from The Hollywood Reporter where they, they interviewed uh, Annie Vershing, who plays the right. Borg yeah. Queen. Borg Queen, yeah. And one of the questions that came up was, so she's the third different actress to play the role. So we got, the, but she has played, she's played she, she, and she played some, something recently. Um, she, she was, she was in a trek last year. All right. Well, we'll circle back to that. The The point of this piece was that we, we got the first, Oh Borg no, she, queen she's was the in. voice of the board queen in, in lower decks. That's what it is. There it is. So yeah, yeah they, they had, the Borg Queen in First Contact. We had the Borg Queen in the final episode of Voyager. And now this is the third iteration where we've seen the Borg Queen. And so the question mm-hmm. came up, are they the same person? Mm. Because obviously the Borg are connected through uh, dimensions. They establish that. They're connected through time. They establish that. Are we supposed to imagine that the Borg queen is the same character that we always see and that they always see her as the same? Or is the idea that they are incarnations of the queen? There's always a queen, like there's always a queen bee in a hive. So if one queen dies, they just have another queen like are they do they start with an infant and the infant grows to be the queen like a queen bee i I don't know so anyway this piece was really interesting because it talks about the possibility and so annie weighs in on this and says in my opinion she's a different arc incarnation of the queen right my version is going to have all the information and all the memories that the other two queens have but she's her own incarnation of the queen so it's good as far as context for us to frame it the same way and think we're not supposed to think that it's Alex Krieg playing the same queen we saw in first contact. It's supposed to be another iteration of the same character. Right. Does that make sense for you guys? Does that feel more satisfying or less satisfying? I feel like it makes sense because I'll I'll make two different analogies of how they can be the same, but not really the same. Uh, So I've got my iPhone here on my desk. It's backed up with iCloud. If I throw this one (laughs) into the river, I can He's restore. always throwing his phone in the river, this guy. I'm telling you, he's been doing <laughs> it for four restore. years. I can restore to what's ostensibly a new iPhone, but it's really the same iPhone, right? All my connectivity, all my accounts and everything, my data is all there. And then there's also the analogy of like the Doctor Who regenerations where they're like completely different people, but it's still the same person. Yeah. Yep. No, that's you got that's you got us there. Sorry, Harry. You got us there with the Doctor Who one for sure. Yeah, yeah. You knew you knew your audience. You played that one well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway, I, I just thought this was a really nice little uh, bit of context to add to this episode because I found myself looking at her thinking, it's funny because obviously the makeup is very similar. The look is very similar. It's funny, subtle differences, though. Like, I found maybe it was just the way she was playing the character, but, like, Alex Alice Krieg's version from First yeah, Contact the best. Yeah. was very... Uh, I mean, obviously, she's trying to seduce Data... And she's sort of playing, but she was playing the, the board queen is very sexual, mm-hmm. very touchy. And that's a little different. We saw a much more sort of a militaristic kind of version in the final episode of Voyager, just a different spin on the character, but it not as nuanced. It was, she really wasn't the same gravitas as first contact, obviously here. She seemed more robotic in the stuff we've seen, but then that is supposed to be tied into the fact that she's disconnected from the hive she's and she's twitchy, kind of having a yeah, mental yeah, breakdown yeah, and whatever. Yeah. So you can't really read too much into it. Maybe going forward, she's a little bit different. But yeah, I just I thought it was, it was interesting sort of how she's choosing to sort of play the character. I thought that was neat. Yeah. No, I thought it was a good good twist to have her sort of play the the, the way she's doing it. Um trying to find this reference to the queen now it's bugging me <laughs> um i mean to alice to uh to um 
Annie Worshing, because we talked about her before. We've had her, we've mentioned her on the show. Yeah, we think. talked about her because she's she has like uh, we talked about her and her her sci fi bona fides, right? Like she's got yeah. um, she's been in all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah, she was in that um, show that I watched about uh, revolution. I think it's called about when the Earth falls apart or they lose technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was one of the voices on Last of Us too, which is that's pretty good. Right. Let's look down the list here. Let's see. She was on. She was on Angel. She was in Supernatural. She was in the the Mugado Mugado, the one that Mimi likes to say. Oh Mugato. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so we were, talked about her on Runaways, right? She was one of the one of the one of the parents. Yeah, on Runaways. one of the moms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that was I think the part that we had clicked with. But he was the blonde baddie. Yeah, and yeah, again, if you look down her IMDb, it's, it's pretty impressive. Like yeah. sci-fi stuff here, you know, Vampire Diaries and mm -hmm. Angel and Supernatural, and just you know, she's been clearly a working actress for quite a while. Lots of stuff. So, but she was something, and she had some role in the. Um... Oh, here, Star Trek Picard Annie Worshing joins season two cast. Oh, that's what we talked about her coming to this mm -hmm. board screen. Okay, yep. she hadn't done it yet at that point. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the connection. I just found the article. There you go. Julio. We did it. All right. All right. So let's move on to the watch list. I have some some sad news as a real-time follow-up. I just found this on, I just was thumbing through Twitter as we were recording here. I know I'm not paying attention, but um, <laughs> uh, we've lost Emilio Delgado, who played Louis R Rodriguez on Sesame Street. On Sesame Street. Street. Yeah, I saw it earlier yeah. today. Yeah, that's yeah. sad. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we'll have to. What, what, what do we pour out for Sesame Street characters? So we don't pour out scotch. We have to pour out something, right? Uh, something, something healthy. Yeah, Kool Aid, glass of milk, maybe. Maybe milk. Yeah, milk and cookies, and we'll have some milk and cookies. And I used to watch cookies. Sesame Street first thing in the. It was it was on at like ten o'clock in the morning. Uh, so that was one of those like when you're a little kid. It's right on, on right on right before or right after Mr. Dress. It was on after Mr. Dress Up. Yeah. So so the funny thing for, it was on eleven o'clock in the morning. I think right. Yeah. Um, just before lunch, but because you know, of course, if you were in school, you missed it. So if you had stayed home sick, you got to. I got. I mean, for me, it came out when I was in grade three, so you know, yeah. so I had to skip school to watch it. But um, um, which isn't such a bad idea. Skip school and watch Sesame Street. But so what was funny about Sesame Street for us as kids, Jaime, was the Spanish contact because we don't. Spanish is not a language here in Canada. Per se, right? Well, I mean, it is. Course. It's just not an official language. Well, no. I mean, and I was going to say, worldwide, Spanish is 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 hugely popular, and, and and probably more than English and French. But but it's just odd that you know that there's a lot of Spanish content in Sesame Street for us. I mean, now we have our own Sesame Street with French in it. But um, but what did you what did you think about that growing up, Jaime, in El Paso? Yeah. Um, hmm. I'm maybe the wrong person to ask, weirdly enough, just because I don't. Speak, <laughs> I just realized that as you, as the, I don't speak Spanish, but you know, growing up in a highly Spanish-speaking uh, city and and culture, um, hmm, I don't know. I might have to like like is like is Spanish. Like, I mean, I know I know down south in the south part of of the United States where you're close to Mexico, and and there's a lot of you know, obviously again, like again, the whole population of the world is pretty high Spanish-speaking population, but. Is that like does it does the Spanish speaking culture permeate through the entire United States or is it pro primarily down south and west? It'll be in different pockets where you know immigrant communities tend to be. So of course near the southern border, um, basically all of California. But then you'll get weird pockets like here in Washington State, the Hispanics, uh, Mexicans in particular, are predominantly in um what we call it call it like central southeastern washington because that's where a lot of the fields and a lot of the apples and other stuff like basically you know um uh, fruit picking opportunities are and and so you have those in other spots of the u.s as well yeah actually we get that too in our in our in our uh, horticulture we have people coming up here to who are experts at picking cherries and blueberries and stuff like that Yep, yeah, we actually a have thing. a pretty pretty decent migrant uh, uh, population as well doing the same thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and that was a big problem with with COVID is they couldn't cross the border to come and work. Well, and the other problem was is that they were, as with a lot of migrants, they weren't uh, housed or treated very properly. So COVID spread like a wildfire through the migrant communities. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let's just jump into the, the, the Jonathan. You're up first with the 
Yeah. So my first one is uh, I'm very excited for is Turning Red. We talked about that previously. It's the new Pixar movie. It is debuting on Disney Plus uh, on March 11th. And yeah, it just looks like a lot of fun. Uh, it's, you know, obviously, I think there's a little special, special place in my heart for this one, given that it's set in Toronto. It from all the trailers I've watched, uh, it seems very reflective of the kind of city that I grew up in. It's very multicultural. It's very uh, identifiable. And um, yeah, I mean, it's even got some Canadian stars. Sandra Oh is is in it as, as one of the voices. And so is um, Matre Ramakrishnan, who plays uh, the lead character on Never Have I Ever on Netflix. She is, uh, is one of the voices as well. And yeah, it just looks like super fun that, you know, the whole thing's sort of an allegory for, you know, puberty and, and growing up and, and just the awkwardness of being a, a tween. And it just looks like a perfect Pixar magic. And I really hope that it, uh, it finds its, its audience. Cause it looks great. Um, the second thing that I had was DMZ. We got the first trailer this week for DMZ. I had mentioned that on a previous episode. So DMZ, what's, what's demilitarized zone, demilitarized zone. You got it. So, uh, DMZ was a comic that came out through DC comics, vertigo now defunct vertigo imprint a number of years back. The book centered around a young, uh, journalist who goes into Manhattan Island, which is now the DMZ after the second U S civil war. And he is there sort of as an embedded journalist and, and it sort of covers his adventures. They've taken it a little bit of a different direction for the TV series, which is I'm told a limited event series for HBO max. It is going to be uh, a four episode series and they're dropping it all at once. So you can sort of just, just, just dig right into it. The premise of this, uh, what they're doing for this one is they're going to um, have it center around Rosario Dawson's character, who was from Manhattan, gets separated from her child when they're evacuating civilians from it. And she returns back to the DMZ that is Manhattan Island and has to go and try and figure out what happened to her child inside this DMZ. So they took the DMZ principle and just sort of changed up the, the lead role on it. Um, so is Snake Plissken in this movie? Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not the same as in, it's not supposed to be like, you know, the, the prison, but you're right. You're on the right track. <laughs> you're on the right track. Um, but yeah, I think it looks really good. The trailer looks good. I, again, I'd watch Rosario Dawson, you know, read the telephone book to me. I think she's an incredibly captivating performer. Um, uh, one of my very favorites. And I think that this, um, yeah, that this could be really good. Um, I'm, I'm excited that they've taken this property and, and done something with it. Although uh, I, I'm not sure how to feel about it. I kind of want to see what the, the, whether the proof is in the pudding, the book was great, whether or not this keeps that vibe. Uh, I, I guess I'll be really curious to find out. Anyway, it's streaming on uh, HBO Max uh, on starting on March 17th in the United States. I haven't seen it promoted here, but if I had to say, I would say since we have HBO through Crave, it'll probably be on Crave here. But uh, yeah, it looks, I think it looks really good. And um, we'll check out the, you can check out the trailer in the show notes. There was another show that had that same uh, oh, revolution. I already talked about that one too, where the um, the aliens take over and the the kids get stuck. They get on the wrong side of the wall, and the parents mm -hmm. have to go rescue mm -hmm. them. Same sort of principle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last one, I, I just added this in because I just noticed it uh, while we were while I was doing what Tim was doing. Uh, so just doing a quick scan to see if we missed anything. Uh, they've announced that uh, Death on the Nile, the latest uh, Agatha Christie adapted big budget movie starring Kenneth Branagh is going to come to Disney Plus on March 30th. So that makes sense. That's about the same time frame as the the, the 40 day kind of window that that they've been sort of keeping to. It came out in theaters in in um early February. So that that would be about right. And um I liked the first one. I thought the the Murder on the Orient Express was was really well done. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, very. You know, I mean, I I, I had read those books. My grandmother was a huge Agatha Christie fan, so those were those little books were always around, and she got me reading those. I was an, a crazy reader when I was younger, so I read a ton of those books. So, I of course had known how that one played out 
but uh but it's still really enjoyed the performances again it's top notch cinematography is gorgeous the sets are gorgeous the the costumes and like everybody in that movie was a star so i'm i'm curious to see if they can keep the momentum up with with death on the nile you know tim and you had mentioned on a previous episode that you know, you sort of hummed and hawed over whether that was a seat yeah, in the movie that. theater kind yeah, of yeah. thing. I'm sure it would probably be beautiful on the, on the big screen. Hopefully they'll continue mm-hmm. to make these because they really are timeless and, and, and really well-written mystery novels. Well, we, I think Death of the, uh, the Orient Express and Death on the Nile were also made in the 70s, maybe early, the late 70s, I think. And they're, they're worth watching too, right? So, um, but yeah, this is, um, this is Hercule. I, I like Hercule Poirot as a character a lot so yeah death on the nile is definitely a, a one i want to watch and of course i've read the book as well too so yeah i don't know that i would have gone with kenneth Branagh, but i think he did a good job in the first one hopefully yeah it, uh... well i mean the, the guy who played perot in the in the early ones is, was the guy from network the one like, yeah, yeah. mattis hell and i can't take it anymore what's yep. his name yeah oh i know the guy you mean yeah 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 but he played perot perot in the um in the, the 70s versions cool all right so for me, I got uh, a couple of things. One is uh, I got managed to get the Apollo Mur- the Apollo Murders out of the Toronto Public Library as an audio book written by Chris Hadfield, the astronaut who fell to Earth. Um, he he's you know famous for flying in in the space in the International Space Station. He was the captain, first Canadian captain of the space station for a while. Um, he also was the one who did the space oddity video with his guitar floating through the the station with special permission from David Bowie as well. Um, And so this book is really good because, you know, this is written by a guy who has been in space uh, for one thing. So he knows all the sort of procedures and protocols and that kind of stuff that goes on. It's about a fictitious Apollo 18 mission. They did actually plan to have Apollo 18 and 19 um, missions, but Nixon canceled them for budgetary reasons and because of what happened in Apollo 13. So they did build all the gear, like the, all the, the ships and stuff were, were created. Um, in fact, if you go to Smithsonian in in um, Washington D.C., you can see one of the lunar lunar landers there, and as well as some uh, the, the actual original command module from Apollo 11 is there too. But um, so it's it's a good story. It's it sort of takes the point of view that um, the Russians who are running around on the, the Russians actually didn't send people to the to the moon. They sent a a um, a robotic car uh to the moon and they drove it from earth like you know they they would send it a signal and wait 20 minutes and see what it did uh so it was called lunacot and lunacot means moonwalker in in russian so they they sort of come up with this, this the story centers around the fact that um the russians have discovered something or the lunacot has discovered something on the moon and the americans want to go and they've also put up a spy satellite around the earth and so the americans have now the the military has taken over the apollo program and so they've got military uh, trained like army and navy trained um uh, astronauts now and they go up their mission is to go up and disable the um the uh sa- the spy satellite uh El- elmas i think it's called which was a real satellite that the russians had actually did put up they put two of them up the first one burned up the second one um stayed up for a bit and, and it had a, 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 a cannon that can fire you know actual bullets and stuff like that on it as well and then they were to go to the then continue to the moon as part of the apollo mission and and disable the lunacot that was the sort of premise behind the book um you can imagine that something goes wrong when they get to the elmas and then something goes wrong on the way to the moon um and there's there's all sort of russian american intrigue and espionage and all that kind of stuff that happens in the book so it's kind of fascinating from that point of view because of, of course you know russia was still the um the um ussr at that point and uh but what's really good about it is is he's he's done a lot a lot of, a lot of technical homework on the actual act of going to the moon the equipment the astronauts would have worn things about their suits you know things about um, launch and re-entry, um, you know, traveling from, you know, tra- flying around in, you know, space from the position of someone who's been there for one thing. And, and also from the point of view that, um, you know, like he, he really did the homework on, you know, he had access to all the people at, you know, in, at NASA to sort of, and all the research and information to sort of put all these things together. 
So yeah, if you're a, if you're a Mooney at all, or you're into the Russian or, or American space programs, um, definitely a worthwhile read. And of course, a good good murder mystery because um, obviously murder right in the title. I don't have to give that away, right? And with this, it's a plural murder, so there I'll, I'll leave that with you as well. But yeah, definitely worth either a read if you want to read the book, or definitely get it as a, an audio book. Um, does he read the book? Unfortunately, he doesn't. But that said, the guy who does read it, and I've forgotten his name now, but the, the person who does read it does a really good job of switching between uh, American and different different American characters as well as Russian characters. And there's a there's a cosmonaut, a lady cosmonaut in in the story. Um, and so he does a good job of switching between male and female voices, too. So, I mean... I, it's it, it's it, you know if I've seen I've met Chris Atfield I've been to a few lectures by him I've read a number of his books and I've had listened to audio books by him as well the pacing of, it's it, part of it's the writing style but also the way the guy delivers he sounds like Chris Hatfield like he has the same cadence and stuff like that too right so you can definitely if you if you're familiar with Chris Hatfield's writing you know that this is definitely his voice in the writing so uh, as well as you know the way so it, it comes off as as possible. Or, you know, you you do know it's not Chris Hadfield because he's able to switch voices. But um, I mean, that's that's the good sign of a of a good audiobook reader, someone who can actually carry off you know the fact that it's not the same person reading every part, right? So yeah, that works out pretty well. And his Russian is good, so like you know he speaks English or uh, speaks American and Russian. So let's put it that way. Definitely, definitely recommend that book if you're if you're into that kind of thing. And of course, it fits in with our sort of star gazing, star trekking kind of stuff, right? And just to hear a quick note here, that's, I don't know if you, did you mention Susanna Thompson earlier, Jonathan? I did not. Susanna Thompson played the Borg Queen the second time. She played it on uh, Voyager, I guess it was. Voyager was? Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I was fishing for her name and I I couldn't pull it out, so thanks for that. Yeah, so she's she's the Borg Queen version two. Oh, I know what I was going to say earlier about, about the Borg Queen is that she recognizes the Picard as Locutus too, which is, which is kind of interesting, right? Yeah, that's it's kind of grind his gears just a little bit. And he's like, you know, I can't get away from this. Yeah, <laughs> like everywhere, every time I run into you people, you get my you name think you're wrong. out, and they keep dragging you back in again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, can't get away from it. All right, and over to you, Jaime. Mine is in the spirit of very soon. We're going to see um, the uh, the the Enterprise from the you know roughly Kirk adjacent era Star Trek Brave New, sorry, Strange New Worlds. So here's somebody who has taken the Star Trek, the motion picture style intro for visuals and done that in the TNG style of audio. And it's a little trippy seeing it there and done in that style, but it's, uh, it's pretty neat. We wanted something to kind of get a little bit of uh, peanut butter in your chocolate sort of thing. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, I guess that's it for another week. So, hey, Jonathan, people want to get in touch with you, where do they find you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as at GPK News. And, honey, people can get in touch with you. I'm on Twitter as at Dev with the Hair. All right. My name is Timitra, T I M M I T R A, on the Twitter machine is where you'll find me. And so, until next time, we'll see you in the future. Or maybe we'll go back to 2024 and see you in the past. <laughs> Bye. The past future? The future past? The past, the past future, yes, of course. Yep. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Spotcast podcast. This is CNN. What's that? Oh, I just thought the James Earl Jones thing was kind of cool. Oh, wrong show. Right. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at Patreon.com slash Spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, Spotcast.com slash Sponsor Us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future.
Okay, so I am speaking of working really hard. I worked really hard to stay awake during Discovery today, but that's another point. You're really uh, down on Discovery lately, geez. No, it's, it was okay. It was just like I just, it's a long day, and it's it's too late in the day for me to try and absorb it and sit there and pay attention. You know, like oh, well, mind you, I'm almost I'm almost I'm almost finished um, Clone Wars. I'm on the uh, I'm on the the, the two parter with Darth Maul. I guess it's two. I don't know if it's two parters or not, but yeah. The, I think it's like like the there's like four episodes left or something. How you like it in the last season? It's pretty good. I mean, I just went through the whole thing with we can talk about. Well, I just went through the whole thing with Ahsoka and um, uh, the sisters, right? Yeah, 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 and, yeah. That part was okay. I didn't, I didn't, didn't love every bit of that, but I do like it when yeah. they focus on Ahsoka. But well, the... and then, then Bo-Katan comes back, yeah, and then and, and Ahsoka's obviously grown quite a bit, right? This is obviously like many, many years later, right? So yeah, I don't think it's a lot. I think it's a couple of years, anyways. But... Well, the one, the one thing that I thought was interesting was was when she and Bo-Katan are going back to Mandalore to take over, and mm. they have this, they have that sort of conference where uh, Obi Wan, Obi Wan is like holographically there. And he says, she says, where's Anakin? He says, or, or wh- what about, wh- let's go and ask Count Dooku. And he sort of says, um, you know, we can't because Anakin just killed him, yeah. you know, which yeah. is like from the third movie. So like, I guess that the, this is now, dov- this is now overlapping. Yeah. The last three episodes sort of overlap with the, with the final movie as far as timeline. So you, you get. Uh, you get the Order sixty six stuff. You get the fallout of that. So yeah, I I really dug the last three episodes of the series. I thought it was a really cool sort of parallel story. Yeah. And am I supposed to watch the Clone Wars movie after this, or does, no? The movie was happen? first actually. The movie movie's the pilot. Oh, I was supposed to watch the movie first. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. That's how they I asked the, you that at the very beginning. The only thing that's worth that that is worth watching. It's actually not a great movie at all, uh, no, and I it's, it's, it's by far not the not the best uh, Clone Wars story. The only thing you find out in that one is just how they come by that you know that ship that they fly around in Anakin's like junker ship that he flies around in all the time. Uh, maybe the one that like the wing flies out, flips out sideways and stuff. That anyway, oh, that's that how thing? they get that oh. ship. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's you, you should watch it just for completionist sake but it's it's not it's not great so i was supposed to, be, I was supposed to watch clone wars and oh no it's true i guess that's true because this last the it's funny because the the label on on disney is the last season even though it was watching like the first six it still said the last season yeah what you should do is is finish clone wars then listen to the audiobook of star wars ahsoka and then okay. you should watch rebels oh, okay oh okay so oh, good they uh, they announced this week that they are lifting our mask mandate here in Ontario, effective on the 21st. So you will no longer be required to wear a mask in most places. The only place you still have to wear it is like long-term care facilities, hospitals, and transit. And anywhere Tim is. Yeah, and it's funny because I, I every Thursday, it's funny coincidence that every Thursday morning I meet with one of our staff epidemiologists. And then we also do this podcast. So I feel like I'm always refreshed with new information, but she was just like, Oh, for the love of God, don't take your mask off. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She's like, that is a political decision. That is not a medical decision. So yeah. So she was, she was pretty adamant. She's like, if you want to, you can take your mask off, but I don't recommend it. He's like, she said when they put the mask mandate in in Ontario, there was 150 cases a day and they're taking it down in spite of the fact that we're still at 12,000 cases a day. So, okay, so I need I need help here. Oof. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the um, Toronto Library, Toronto Public Library. Mm-hmm. I looked for Ahsoka, couldn't find it. So it's got Star Wars: The High Rep Pub something, the Jedi Republic. Academy. Uh, the Ron, the author Ron. is E.K. Johnson for the Ahsoka book. It's E. Period K. Period Johnson J O H N S T O N. Period K. Period J O H N. Oh, do I, oh, oh, E.K. Johnson. Okay, I got it here. J- Johnston. 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 Johnston with a T-O-N. Johnston. Oh, here it is. Okay, I can borrow this one. Um, borrow. Oh, I can borrow it right away. Cool. There you go. So that sort of tells the story of what happens to ah- Ahsoka between Clone Wars and Rebels. Yeah. So this is a cool thing, Jaime, with the Toronto Public Library. I may have mentioned this before on, on More Than Just Code, but I can... I can get audiobooks and stuff. Not everything, right? Mm-hmm. And you and you can't get it right away sometimes because like they have like four titles and you have to share it between all the people who want to listen. So sometimes you 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 put a hold on it and then you're you go into a queue. 
But occasionally you get like this, like I guess the Ahsoka book is so old or people don't know about it. That yeah, I it's, just, it's been I, out for a few years, so yeah, but probably I can a little bit. I can borrow it right now, right? Like there's a mm-hmm. Dryden book I'm kind of going through the same same deal. I just it's about Scotty Bowman. I can that one I can you know borrow anytime. But I just did the the um, I'll talk about it in my pick is is um, Chris Hadfield's mystery novel that he wrote. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. He's got another book out now, doesn't he? Have a new book. Um, I think this is a new book. Oh, I thought I saw something at the store the other day. I don't remember what the hell it was. Some other something something else red cover. No, 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 no. This was something else. That's it. I got to go to bed. It's like one thirty. <sighs> All right. All righty. All right. See you next Talk week, guys. Later. See you. Bye. Bye. Recently, our client John met his banker to discuss plans for a clean energy building. What he found was a shared passion for building something more. Momentum for change. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John.